For 130,000 years, our capacity for reason has remained unchanged. The combined intellect of the neuroscientists, engineers, mathematicians, and hackers <laughs> in this auditorium pales in comparison to even the most basic AI. Once online, a sentient machine will quickly overcome the limits of biology. And in a short time, its analytical power will be greater than the collective intelligence of every person born in the history of the world. So now imagine such an entity with a full range of human emotion, even self-awareness. Some scientists refer to this as the singularity. I call it transcendence. You are an old man who thinks in terms of nations and peoples. There are no nations. There are no peoples. There are no Russians. There are no Arabs. There are no third worlds. There is no West. There is only one holistic system of systems. One vast and immense interwoven, interacting, multivariate, multinational dominion of dollars. Petrodollars, electrodollars, multidollars, Reichmarks, rims, rubles, pounds, and shekels. It is the international system of currency which determines the totality of life on this planet. That is the natural order of things today. That is the atomic and subatomic and galactic structure of things today. Welcome to Bright Dimensions, where ineffective non-gamers like you can, with the right guidance and rehabilitation, actually become effective. Both hands. At Bright Dimensions, you can improve your cognitive functionality until you are finally ready to step back out into the world and start contributing. Put me on the leaderboard of life. It's not too late for you to become peak humanity. Transcend humanity through gaming. Hello. Be <laughs> beloved audience. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so we just want to make sure you all know yeah. what's going on with us right now. That we're here and we're talking about edibles. Yeah. And, and uh, the recordings in progress for quality control. Yep. So there it is. Welcome everyone to the Spine Crackers <laughs> podcast. This is a what what do we call ourselves? A literature podcast? Literary analysis? A, a sort yeah. of yeah, like a parasocial book club. Yeah, I like that. Boys club, boys Dudes only. rock. No, yeah. not boys only. That's false. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, girls are invited too. Dudes do Anybody rock, else? but that's a separate issue. And when you hear you family. When you mm. hear you family. When you listen in, when you hear this voice, you family. Yeah. So welcome to another episode. I'm Matt. I'm, I'm Paul. And uh, we're reading Paul's pick today. So, Paul, take us away with, uh, you know, all the deets. Yes, yes. Um, Dirty deets. My pick was uh, Don DeLillo's Cosmopolis. Why do you keep <laughs> saying it that way? I don't know. I like it. DeLillo. It Don is nice. Don DeLillo. Cosmopolis. <laughs> Cosmopolis. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, you, sound like a fuck, you sound like a fucking, like someone from game of thrones like one of their like far eastern characters <laughs> I, I, I latch on to doing that sometimes i don't even mean to do it and i just yeah, can't stop that's all right yeah anyway it's don delillo's book cosmopolis mm -hmm. for those of you who can't speak paul yes uh written in 2003 uh takes place in the year 2000 it's delillo's uh, 13th novel prolific dude um, i didn't really realize that you know he was written a lot of books. Yeah. And I don't know when he started writing either or how old he is. I don't really know much about him in particular. He's, he's uh, up there now. He's up there. He's got to be now. 
Is he alive? Yeah, he's alive. He's like he's like 45 something. better off dead dude he's 84 years old yeah that's old. oh wow yeah yeah that's that's when you start dying as a man his wikipedia (laughs) picture is intense way before really it's funny because his speaking voice is one of those ones that doesn't really match like the sort of grave look that he gives in almost all of his like publicity photos what is is he just like super cheery and like like no, he's just yeah, he's, he's got a little bit of a lisp and he's just like a Jewish kid from the Bronx. So he's just like, you know, yeah. and I just was, you know, it's just like he kind of looks like the Clint Eastwood of fiction writers. Yeah, <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. He's got an edge to him. He's got a leather jacket on in this picture. Yeah, he's definitely. Well, you know, one of the books he wrote was Libra, uh, the one about like Lee Harvey Oswald. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was I was listening to him talk about it. Apparently he said he like grew up on the same block as Lee Harvey Oswald. No shit. Wow. Yeah. So is that like, a confession? Yeah, that it was him yeah. and Lee working in tandem. That would be so <laughs> epic. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't mean to derail your uh, synopsis there, Paul. The uh, the last book he writes is My Grassy Knoll. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How my former friends stole my glory. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's Lee Harvey Oswald's stolen valor. <laughs> just on his deathbed like i blew a hole in that motherfucker <laughs> uh, one of my favorite i don't know if I, I may have actually talked about this on the podcast before i'm not sure but what i went to I, I don't know this is neither here nor there and maybe we should skip it but i was in i've been to i went to dallas and i went to the like jfk site and all that and they it's right it's very weird they 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 have like a permanent like x like painted on the street where which is a still I'm like it's a very busy street in Dallas and um but I went to the the Texas book depository where Lee Harvey Oswald you know shot him from right in the window and there's a little like memorial plaque on the side where it says you know it's like oh on this date or whatever you know Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly you know assassinated right. president jfk and like uh, around the word allegedly there's like a scrawl like 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 uh, gouging out of the plaque like with a knife and stone and stuff <laughs> <laughs> it's, just like, it's, it's very epic i mean the weirdos that go i mean you can take the full tour right like there's yeah a, oh, yeah. a genuine like you know we'll walk you through well and, i assume and, they operate on the grassy knoll theory right because there's obviously yeah. a ton and in in Dallas, at, well, in in a lot of Texas, actually, the, in, if you go into any used bookshop in Texas, most of the time there's an entire section dedicated to JFK conspiracy theory books. <laughs> oh, you just go into a, a Bucky's, and there's just the like, yeah, <laughs> you know, dollar books, JFK section, truth, the truth. Anyway, I have no desire to go on a tour like that ever. It'd be zero I desire to. I would love that. You'd be surprised by yourself, Paul. I bet. Anyway, Paul, yeah, why did yeah. you uh, why did you pick this book? This Don Don Delillo. Don Delillo. One of the most delightful names in heavy postmodern literature. Super like pleasurable to say. I'll give you that, yeah. Paul. It, there's something yeah. to saying it. That's basically why I picked this book by Don Delillo. <laughs> <laughs> Don. Uh, no, I picked it because uh, our. F- kind of friend almost good friend soon to be on one of YouTube. our best friends really yeah probably yeah. my closest friend yeah he is my best friend <laughs> wow when i think about it uh he he had a good video on Book, uh, we're talking about bookshore book, i don't know if we book got shore. that out there yeah on youtube shore, yeah man, yeah he had a good video on uh, mirakami and kind of bashing mirakami and i thought it was interesting even though i like mirakami and he brought up delillo's name and said that he just like moved on from Mirakami on to Delillo and kind of has stuck with him since. So I was just, you know, I wanted to give Delillo a, a read. I haven't read any book by him before. And Gabe, you said that you haven't either. And Matt has. Um, so that's basically why I chose it just to get a new author under my belt and someone that I respect. This isn't sure. revenge. This isn't revenge for the Murakami bashing. <laughs> Keep Murakami's name no, out of your know. mouth. <laughs> yeah. I can say no, it again. I, I, I liked his video on Murakami is entertaining to hear someone just like absolutely hate him, but I yeah. wasn't like pissed no, it off was a, by it. It's a good video sort of about how people develop as readers over time. And it wasn't just yeah. about bashing Murakami on it, but yeah, no, he went on like a journey with him. And yeah, exactly. Um, 
Um, but no, yeah, he was said, there. Um, oh. No, I, no, that that was basically. Yeah, I just wanted to read him. Yeah, well, I mean, it's good because he's kind of one of the one of the like uh, heavy hitters of like modern or postmodern American literature, right? Like he's he's often grouped with your your pensions and your fucking uh i don't know who else is in that mccarthy john, Cormac mccarthy i guess john or, barth i don't yeah, know yeah yeah he, he's a he's a heavyweight gaddis? contemporary I don't know. yeah gaddis or the fucking um he's yeah. younger than all those people though i think or, he, maybe not mccarthy he's 84 I don't know now how, i don't know how old mccarthy he's a young is. man of 84 he was at one point a uh, like young buck coming up you know i mean it's always it's, I not, don't know. it's like mccarthy pension and delillo are all still alive and i wouldn't have it, like it's kind of that's kind of shocking to me yeah yeah man how old is pension now pension has got to be fucking up there in that same range and mccarthy you think, too do you like think the Noam chomsky era range of just like just fucking Grip chugging along, type. yeah. Gnome straight yeah. up looking like a gnome further into his like he's just straight up yeah. just a character from Labyrinth at this point. Just like <laughs> yeah, his last speech is just gonna. He's so soft spoken already, but his last speech is gonna be just like <laughs> subtitles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the environment. <laughs> All right, so so McCarthy is eighty eight, so he's older than Delillo even. And Pynchon mm. is 84. So they're oh. all all in that range. So I think McCarthy's the oldest. Yeah, McCarthy's the oldest. Do you th- I mean, he's supposedly got some something that he's been bashing away at for so long. A novel? Uh, yeah. Oh. I think him. Do you think oh, I him? Thought he meant like a disease. No. <laughs> like I, like... I mean, that I'm not sure. But like, uh, yeah. So do you think uh, both McCarthy and Pynchon will be able to release... You think they got like one more in them? Probably before George R. R. Martin, am I right? Oh, oh my yeah, God. <laughs> definitely. Oh, damn, dude. Shout out. Got him. Got him. Got him good. Um, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. JFK. I would say out of them, out of those three, DeLillo is probably the most likely, just based on like his rate of output He's to, re- to release another novel. Uh, but he's also the youngest, so that might be a little bit of a little bit cheating. He's the boy of the group <laughs> by like a, by like a year, <laughs> one year. Yeah. Spry. Wait. So you want to do a quick synopsis before we before we just like go go? Yes. Yes. So the, the like I said, the novel was written in two thousand three and it takes place in two thousand, and it's about a, uh, oh, a young twenty eight year old man. Uh, named Eric Packer, who's like a billionaire Wall Street man guy trading in st- the stock market, and he's interested it's a in hedge, basically yen. a hedge fund, right? Yeah, yeah, he's a yen, a yen. Yeah, man. yeah, he works in like money markets, like trading. Well, he, I mean, he's he's got a diverse portfolio, as he talks about throughout the book. Yes. Yeah, he's kind of a yeah. what's what's a what's what do they describe Ray in Star Wars as? Like a character who kind of does everything. What's what? that called? <laughs> What a tinker! <laughs> no, like the, the character in a in a movie or a book that can has like is like almost perfect with Mary every Sue. Skill. Oh, I think you're talking Mary you're, Sue. Yeah, that's a, I think that that's not a what that means. Connotation. Yeah, really? that means like a boring person that like serves no purpose. Well, a, Mar- a Mary that's Sue. Kind of what Eric Mar- Parker is, a, is. Well, a Mary Sue is a character that can do no wrong and nothing bad can happen to them because they're too integral right. to the story oh, okay. and all that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. Never mind. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're saying Eric Packer <laughs> is like that? Well, he's just like, you know, he's like a young guy who's very, very successful and, you know, handsome and smart and seems to like everything that he touches turns to gold type guy yeah. in some ways. But he's also um, pretty, like pretty straight. Maybe this is spoilers, but he's pretty straightforwardly a sociopath also. In, in, I am. Yeah, they yeah. get down to the point where like they almost claim autism at some point. I feel like, uh, like almost by name. Yes, uh, I, I do think that comes up. Um, but it's never. I don't think really mentioned, but gets close, especially when he's like conversing with his wife. Yeah, uh, who's kind of like his emotional half, essentially. So okay, so just finish the summary here. What 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 happens in the book? 
basically, you know, it takes place in New York City and he's basically um, traveling across town in his limousine um, trying to get a haircut. Um, and along the way, there's a presidential appearance and the, the traffic gets stopped and there's like, you know, shit that happens there. And then there's a, a big protest. Um, and what else is there? There's like a a flash the, mob of naked people in a movie yeah and he also just meets like random women and has sex with them in hotels and comes back to his limousine and or his or know, in his limousine like, or in his yeah. limousine it's basically just like a a slow journey and he has some revel- revelations about who he is and so it's kind of one of those during like, the period of a day yeah it's kind of like a ulysses style like here's like the one it's one day and here's all the crazy shit that happens over the course of the day and these weird events and characters come in and out of the story. And then, uh, yeah. And there's this, I guess like the main kind of like subplot or actual plot, I'm not sure exactly, but is that he, I guess around halfway through the book or a little before gets the news that like he's being basically hunted by someone. There's like a, a threat against his life. Um, yeah because it, it, this all t- again takes place sort of in the milieu of like there's like these anti-capitalist protests happening and there's the president is in town and so there's all this kind of like political tension and turmoil and and uh, it comes through that there's a, a a credible threat is the phrase that gets used over and over again or a specific right. threat or something against his life specifically um and there's two or three sections interspersed throughout the book where we get the perspective and sort of like the writings it's like a journal entries i guess of the guy who is you know set out to kill eric packer which those are my favorite parts of the book there there's only a, a few snippets of of that writing from his perspective and I was yeah like, i like this the most and uh, the book is dedicated to Paul Oster, and those moments were the only ones that felt like Paul Oster's writing to me or an homage to him. Yeah, uh, I think that's an interesting. I don't know. I didn't like. I didn't really know what to make about the dedication because I definitely. And again, this is my first Delillo. Matt, maybe you have some more insight into this in terms of like how how this fits with his style in other books. But I definitely yeah. got some some Paul Oster vibes from some of the scene like just some of the scenes and some of the dialogue and i of course like when you're talking about two big name well-known authors with developed styles it doesn't make sense to say like delillo was trying to like emulate paul auster in some way but you know i i think it's interesting to think about why why that dedication is there i listened to a uh an interview that he gave one of those you know kind of like somewhat usually disappointing just stock book interviews on like public radio uh and they they mentioned they asked him about the paul oster dedication and it was just like i was like oh okay cool i get a little insight and he's just like paul oster is my good friend i just thought it would be nice (laughs) oh wow (laughs) okay there you go (laughs) so anticlimactic asked asked and answered it's one of those things where like i don't don't know if like it's it's always hard for me to discern whether or not like an author, like, I, I feel like, I don't know. It's hard to put yourself in that situation. Cause, uh, but it's like, is he being coy? Is he like, just sort of like right. evading, you know, the way that like some artists do, like the way the Coen brothers are, are like watching paint dry to interview, but <laughs> right, they're, like, right, their, right. their movies are clearly like incredibly like considered and th- whatever. Uh, they're, like so, yeah. watching paint fly in their movies. What? Oof. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That like, was a swing uh, and a that miss. Painter, that painter who splashed Pollock. paintings. Uh, Pollock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to keep going. So yeah. Uh, uh, restart the that. episode. Retracted. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was just like, I was listening to him talk about Cosmopolis specifically. He's like, yeah, Paul Oster is my friend. Uh, I didn't really know much about, you know, uh, like, digital capital and money markets and i just thought it would be kind of cool it's like a very like well that it's like a very comes through so casual <laughs> yeah it definitely comes through but i have a tendency to like over read into stuff uh i think i i, I don't think you should lose that tendency because it's way more fun but like yeah it's just definitely like this guy doesn't sound like 
<laughs> like he's holding back. He's holding something back. Yeah, I don't know. Would you say, Matt, that this is uh, like stylistically and in the writing of the dialogue and stuff, is this like of a piece with DeLillo's other work, in, like in terms of his his overall like aesthetic approach? Yeah, I don't know. I think there's like a I, I haven't read enough because I read Underworld and I read White Noise and then this. Um, and uh, this uh, Cosmopolis at this point is an old, older book. But it's still, I would say, is like later DeLillo, uh, where I think he got a little more spare and cold, I would in feel with his prose. Um, this book, I know, mm. was like in that interview, he was like, I intentionally tried to avoid like a lot of um, descriptors or like, you know, whatever. Like he, he tried to like pare down his language because he wanted it in this case to like fit the theme of, you know, the new millennium and kind of Eric Packer's whole persona, who's like this guy who's like, he's so wanting to like be ahead and in the new that he just like, he's hypercritical of even language and anachronisms and shit. Right. So uh, in that way, it's, it's probably a, a bit different, but at the same time, I mean, I read Underworld. I found it uh, underwhelming. <laughs> uh, oh, shit. <laughs> no, a little, I don't know, like um, a lot of characters and stuff, but I don't know if you guys felt this way, but um, just sort of how the dialogue was written, what how people say things and their turns of phrases are really weird and yeah. Uh, yeah. consistent amongst all types of people, even though they're supposed to be like very different you know generations and types of people it's like yeah and that's like a postmoderny, i think kind of quirk that yes. I, I don't know how intentional that is or not i was thinking of uh like the yeah the dialogue in particular and everyone kind of having the same like quippy dialogue in general yeah. i was thinking of aaron sorkin <laughs> like in the social <laughs> network <laughs> yeah it's like everyone everyone has like the same sense of humor in that movie and makes yeah. the same sign of jokes and uh, it's almost I uh, used to my favorite movie and it's like unwatchable now solely because of that. Yeah, it's like you got a 28 year old, you know, uh, billionaire, you know, like hedge fund guy talking to like, I don't know, a 70 year old barber from like the west side of New York. And they're both kind of speaking in the same <laughs> like syntax yes, and stuff. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's that yeah. always throws me. Even which, if it's like an which, intentional thing. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like that's obviously a stylistic choice that the Lillo has made here, but, but it is, it is definitely jarring, I think. And, you know, like, th like, for example, like one of the things that jumped out to me is like people will, um, will constantly, this happens like throughout. And again, Matt, this is everybody speaking. Like they will say the word what a a as a question, but it's written as a, as a statement and it's like yeah. a way of like finishing what the person before them speaking has just said. So it's like, for example, like if I asked you like, uh, you know, oh, uh, um, or if I just said like, you know, I'm gonna, and I kind of trailed off and you said, you're gonna what? You know what I mean? But it's as a yeah. question that, that, that is like used a lot throughout this novel as a like dialogic device and yeah but, but it always feels like a little skewed and in a and like not appropriate conversationally and and i think yeah. I, I don't know that that's necessarily a weakness like i said it's obviously an intentional choice that that delil has made to write the dialogue this way um I, I i just wasn't really sure what to make of it or how it fit into sort of like the the overall message of the book which i take to be something about you know the nature of futurity and how the future is kind of like always as this kind of like um monolithic concept intruding into our lives and you know like sort of gravitationally affecting us in these various ways and blah 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 blah. and i think it's part that's one sort of point of the book yeah i'm not sure i and it could just be part of his self-imposed goal in the novel just kind of regardless of everything or just like less is more clip it you know really like terse a lot of like repetition um like people like just saying something and then someone just rephrasing the same thing and I, yeah it doesn't come across like that though like it, it felt like he was overly editing and 
adding in certain turns of phrase and like kind of turning the conversations on their head by saying something out of place. It felt very much like a try hard goal. It didn't like it did, didn't flow and didn't feel right. And it, especially the, the interactions with him and his wife, uh, Eric and his wife, they were in particular were very awkward. And well, that's because there's like, you know, if for him, you know, he's a very sp- specific type of person where it makes sense. And and then the other a lot of the other time, yeah, he's like talking to like his bodyguard. It's like, OK, these are all like going to be somewhat clipped terse conversations of just the least amount of you know words necessary to communicate whatever yeah and then when you get to like his wife and stuff or like other people that live in the city uh it suddenly becomes clear like he just keeps that same method going and it's just a little bit like what's going on because they're using like colloquialisms and like casual it's then there's like casual turns of phrase added to it to what it is otherwise it's very like cold precise style so you know, it, it felt re- it read I, I actually checked like three or four times while reading it like was this really written in 2003 because because i know it takes place in 2000 which i thought was an odd thing and it, you know it's an odd choice to me anyways like he wrote it but about three years prior but i kept checking back because i was like do i have a weird edition that doesn't say that this was written like 1990 because it almost felt like he was trying to write like future speak or something like a, like how philip mm. K. dick would try to mutate language to fit like a a future decade or something and it was well, it was strange paul we were saying uh like we were talking yesterday and just like it it does it feels like a very dated um book it feels very very 2000 early 2000s and i think that having it be set in the year 2000 was intentional but also like part of that um general what like view back then that i remember pretty clearly of like y2k and like the dot-com bubble and all that shit and like yeah even even though we were current the whole point i think is that like even though we were currently just like living through it the year 2000 it still felt like the future because of the number <laughs> and everyone yeah. was like right oh, the year t-. there was even like conan o'brien bits where he was like in the year 2000 oh, yeah. classic you know like so it was like a joke concept in the late nineties and I'm sure DeLillo, you know, he's, he's an older guy. So it was like, that's probably what he was like thinking of as well. So I, I just found a decent like example that I think I want to read about the the dialogue and the way it's kind of mixed in with the rest. Yeah, of Yeah, do it, do it. Okay. So this is from a scene. It's pretty early on in the book where he's in his limousine um, going to get, uh, you know, ostensibly trying to go get this haircut. Uh, it's on 43 in this edition. Um, and um, it's on the bottom and it's like a page and a half. I'm just going to read it. But uh, he's he, he's getting examined in his limousine by a doctor, which he does apparently every single day. Right. He has daily doctor's examinations. And, um, you know, I, it's it, it, it always takes place in his car or n- not always. But in this case, it's taking place in his car, sort of like implying the sort of like constant, like churning movement of even something as apparent, like seemingly stable as like going to get a doctor's checkup, which is in a room, in a place. And like in modern capitalism, you're always moving, you're always churning and and nothing ever sort of stands still. Um, But anyway, this this is a dialogue that he's having with one of his uh, like advisors, I guess, Jane Melman, um, who he sort of picks up as she's like jogging by him. And he's like, hey, come come in, come here. I got to ask you something. And it's her day off or whatever. So he's getting examined by the doctor in front of her. Jane Melman said, you do this what? Period. Not a question. Um, Not that's not in the text, but I'm just saying like you do this. Right. Yeah. 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 This is like what I was getting at with that, that, that what thing you do this. What, what every day, no matter wherever I am. That's right. No matter. She tipped back her head and plunged a bottle of spring water into the middle of her face. Ingram, who is the doctor, did an echocardiogram. Eric was on his back with a skewed view of the monitor and wasn't sure whether he was watching a computerized mapping of his heart or a picture of the thing itself. It throbbed forcefully on screen. The image was only a foot away, but the heart assumed another context, one of distance and immensity, beating in the blood plum raptures of the galaxy information. What mystery he glimpsed in this functional muscle. He felt the passion of the body, its adaptive drive over geologic time, the poetry and chemistry of its origins and the dust of old exploding stars. How dwarfed he felt by his own heart. 
There it was, and it awed him to see his life beneath his breastbone and image-forming units hammering on outside him. He said nothing to Ingram. He didn't want to talk to the associate. He talked to Nevius now and then, who's the uh, his, uh, one of his other doctors. Nevius had definition. He was all white-haired, tall, and stalwart, with a trace of Middle Europe in his voice. Ingram spoke in mutters of instruction, breathe deep, turn left. It was hard for him to say something he hadn't already said, word ar words arranged in the same tedious sequence a thousand times before. Melman said, so you do what? Same routine every day. Varies, depending. So he comes to your house, nice, on weekends. We die, Jane, on weekends. People, it happens. You're right, I didn't think of that. We die because it's the weekend. I, that, like, I like that line. That was funny. Yeah. Um, I actually hated that line. You did? Okay. Well, maybe we can talk <laughs> about that. Maybe we can drama. talk about that in a second. Um, line drama. <laughs> he was still on his... Yeah, line drama. He was still on his back. She sat facing the top of his head, speaking to a point slightly above it. I thought we were moving, but we're not anymore. The president's in town. You're right. I forgot. I thought I saw him when I ran out of the park. There was an entourage of limousines going down fifth with a motorcycle escort. I thought all these limos for the president I can understand, but it was somebody's fam somebody famous's funeral. We die every day, he told her. He sat on the table now and Ingram looked for swollen lymph nodes under his arm. Eric pointed out a plug of sebum. I don't know what that word means. Sebum. Sebum. Do you know what that word means, Matt? It's like, I think it's just skin oil. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. Eric pointed out a plug of sebum and cell debris on his lower abdomen, a blackhead, slightly sinister. What do we do about this? Let it express itself. What? Do nothing. Let it express itself, Ingram said. So I, I feel like that's sort of representative of the dialogue in this book in, yeah. in the sense that it's, yeah. it's very just like terse and sometimes the responses feel unconnected to what came before it, right? Like about like mm -hmm. just dying on weekends and like, you know, the, the, again, I, I wanted to read that section because of th this thing that, that, that nagged at me throughout the whole book, which is the way what was used in the dialogue. And <laughs> yeah. I, it, 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 it was so recurring and it was from everybody. And I just like, and you, I was trying to make sense of it the whole time. And you can't help like when you when you were reading it just now, it sounded like you were saying what with a question mark. Right. In the text. I, yeah. But every, exactly. every time it's you not. just did, it's it's a period and it yes. is jarring and it, you can't help but read it in your head or out loud saying what like what isn't it also like, like just that thing right like what do we do about this let it express itself what do nothing but it's not it's but what do it's nothing. not it's what yeah. what do nothing what? do nothing yeah. it's yeah. not what? no do the nothing. do nothing isn't even a question it's what do nothing yeah there's no question what? Do, do nothing yeah I, it, it, it's it's also uh there's isn't there like a british interjection too like where you just say that at the end of a sentence as well but, but it me it's not it's also not a question it's just like, like a, a like a uh oh the Ma the manchester boys killed did great at footy this weekend what yeah yeah just basically like just to end it yeah like, oh i didn't know that i don't I know think, if i'm making that up but no i don't think you are but but i don't know what the connection is there to this so maybe there, there might be one but it's that, i think they're just not out. but yeah it just i thought about that and i started hearing those speak english i just, just they started to be english in my mind's <laughs> voice <laughs> or whatever you want to talk about that line that you loved and i hated I, I didn't yeah, like you... love it in some deep literary sense. I just thought it was funny. Oh, okay. I, I don't know why well, you I mean just it to, so much. just to add to your point about the the dialogue in general and how everyone seemed to have like the same dialogue and points of view almost like philosophically, like there were there were a lot of lines like that where I was just kind of shaking my head because they they came across as being like grandiose and thought provoking. But when I read them over again, I was like, this doesn't even make sense. And it's like a weird <laughs> like a uh, kind of eye candy sentence tapped on the end of a section of dialogue or whatever. It, they ended up like really nagging at me. I'll try to find some, I know I underlined some, but that, that was one of the main issues I had with the book too, is that like this uh, propensity, is that a word? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. To um, just kind of interject philosophical one-liners that yeah. came across like juvenile to me. And uh I didn't like it. This I definitely where think I, there was a number of cringe things that fit into that that description, Paul. Well, this yeah. this goes in, and it's kind of funny that I, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, that like I'm like this is where it's dated for me, because I think a lot of this stuff was, if not new, you know, like when I read this when I was 19 and still in college, blah blah blah. It's like I think this hit a little harder or something. Um, but you know, especially for a book about 
newness and like, like you know the future and the present merging finally in some bizarre singularity of its own uh but like yeah that's definitely I, I just wonder if like a lot of these concepts about like now that we've got like fucking cryptocurrency and shit like you know that whole aspect of things and like how how weird it is that money is not really real you know it's a it's an idea that we blah, right blah, blah. and then you've you know now that we've been so enmeshed in in sort of computer reality where you know just instantaneousness is is more ubiquitous this for like more people and so we've we've matured in our kind of like situation and conversations around that I, I feel like that's why this ends up feeling <laughs> paul you said it was like a, it was like when you thought when you watch equilibrium for the first time and you're like this is sick and then later yeah. you watch it and you're like wow this is from the year 2000 basically yeah <laughs> yeah and it it's very difficult to not to to make something uh to have made something during the year 1999 or 2000 and not have it be cringe now and i i can really i can think of like the matrix i can still watch and i think it um did a lot of things that other movies like that like equilibrium and i can't think of any others but they like failed to have that uh timeless whatever yeah well, the matrix uh, to live in the contemporary time by first the the pill analogy and just linguistically now online yeah uh, just being yeah. so everywhere um yeah. I, I wonder like so i think like um i think you're right both both of you are right that like that it's some of the stuff just doesn't hit like it may have hit in 2003 where it's yeah. like you know there there oh like money just there's a lot of like rich just like detailed descriptions of like stock prices scrolling by and like you know scrolling on the thing and it's like the their their value is their impermanence and like blah 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 and it just it comes off today as sort of like just like yeah duh man like we we all sort of intuitively get that at some level i think today anyone who's thought about yeah. capitalism and and sort of technology in the modern condition i think today sort of gets that and that you know there's like a moment where there's this anti-capitalist protest that kind of like erupts around him and um you know one of he, he he happens to have in the car with him at that moment his like his like chief corporate theorist I, you know this like chief right. uh, uh, chief um you know theory officer which is a, which is a real thing for a lot of these like high like billionaire guys they like have you know that actually still tracks they have yeah. like philosophers on staff and stuff they're the resident guru who's yeah like, ex exa exactly um and they make they make this point which like today sort of comes off as to me at least like v really facile about like even this even this protest can't escape capitalism man like they themselves are one of the preconditions of the capitalist system and they don't even know it and I actually underline like, that part. Oh God! Like I actually it, underline it, that it, part. That just felt so cheesy at this point. Like we all know, yeah. and, and and I guess this is you know, like and, and maybe that point has sort of entered the the mainstream consciousness through like Occupy Wall Street, which was, which was, or at least that sort of started that conversation. Um, and of course, that was you know after this book was released. Right, Occupy Wall Street was, was like 2006, when? 2006, yeah, like 2000. No, 2011. Oh, yeah, it so, hadn't happened after the crash, so yeah, yeah, right. So I think that, like, you know, I don't know. Maybe we should give the book more credit than we're giving it in terms of like its anticipatory value. Like maybe it was giving making these points, yeah, before and I think they were commonly understood. But reading it today, shit just does, does not hit the same. I mean, I think that's probably the only real big scene that has that predictory uh, capability, though, like the 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 protest scene. Um, the rest I, of it. I I thought some. I actually of the don't stuff... think a lot of people. Oh, sorry. Ahead, I just sorry. I, I don't think I I mean I know what you mean. Like I am with you. Like this has now been discussed to death. Like the the uh, the performative and even uh, um, actively participating and and welcomed aspect of protests and. Uh, you know, all that um, being just another sort of like method of of media coverage and branding and just whatever. But I still actually think that a lot of people don't don't really think about it that way. Yeah. Or, 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 or you know, I, I think we're taking for granted 
<laughs> how academically people approach the, a lot of this stuff. Like, I feel like direct action and protesting is is often seen simply as a good, right? Wouldn't you say for uh, most may- people? I mean, maybe. I, I don't know. I think, you know, I definitely think that there's, if you're talking about like the 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 pink hat wearing women marchers or the like, you know. Even perform- anti fun like, per- shit, yeah. I, I, okay, I actually would separate those two. I think anyone who, most people who like, that I know who consciously identify themselves as like anti-fascist or whatever, they know, they know all this shit that it's at some right. level, at some level performative and that there's this sort of, you know, uh, n- you know, Neo kind of post Marxian point of the, you know, there's no outside capitalism. There's no, there's no post capitalism or whatever. And I think a lot of people do get that. And, and they, th- that, this is a separate question about people's attitudes towards, towards, you know, direct action or whatever. But I think, right. you know, it depends on who you're talking about, you know, fucking Pete Buttigieg voters. Yeah, they're just going to go to the protest right. and think they did something good. Um, but I guess I mean that because that's such a larger just block. Of people. Yeah, for sure. So, so yeah, I think maybe you're right that we're being a little too cynical and there are more people than maybe we want to admit that still harbor these attitudes. Yeah. But and I. I think I think Delillo is just coming. I, I think another thing that's a little bit like, I don't know, diffuse and kind of is like he is trying to like it's a slim book and he is trying to take on this uh, this kind of this feeling, these premonitions that you could start to like, like if you have sensitivities in your antennae up during the two th- turn of the century. You know, it's like you, you could you could get these little messages and get these inklings, and he's definitely like coming at it obliquely. So he's not. He's not doing the hard commit that could be even more potentially embarrassing for you later in right, <laughs> on when right, you're just right. like, this is what's fucking happening. He is Which taking was- this sort of more like metaphysical, like, oh, who knows what could happen? But these are like the little vibes that I'm picking up right now. Right. Or these are some of the sort of forces or ideological kind of priors Currents. that are going to inform. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, we, what was the what, what, what book did we read recently where we had that sort of conversation? Like someone went a little too hard. On like direct it, predictions, I think it was the Huelbeck book. It might have been the Huelbeck book. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Matt and I were talking about that yesterday. I I found some correlations between the Huelbeck book. I mean, I hate that book was way worse than this book, but yeah, it was similar in that respect. Just kind of like trying to be of the of the recent time uh, is is like a hard task to to tackle. I think. And, and, um, and I think that, you know, again, I think there are some moments in here of like at genuine insight that still, still hold, you know, we, we, the protest thing, I think we could kind of maybe can be on the fence about or whatever, but um, you know, there's a, there's a discussion about uh, when he bought, he buys his like $300 million uh, like multi-story apartment building in this skyscraper or whatever. And I forget who he's talking to. It might be the theorist woman again, but you know, she sort of makes the point that like, when you bought that Kinsky. house, Kinsky, thank you. When you bought that house for $300 million or whatever, the, the value, the thing you bought wasn't the house. It was the money. Like you bought the number, like you bought having bought a $300 million house, you know right, what I mean? Yes. Like, you, which I think that's kind of a subtle and interesting point that people still don't really understand. Uh, going back to this, like money is fake thing. It's like, you're not paying for the good, right? Like the world of material goods is not really salient anymore. You're paying for the number, right? You're paying for having paid that number for a house. Right. Yeah. The The whole like disassociative nature of like being that rich and embracing, you know, right. only a sort of capitalist acquisition, acquisitive kind of like viewpoint as your entire being is 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 also yeah pretty good and still still tracks too like just seeing yourself seeing yourself you know i mean again these are like old conversations from that delillo himself was talking about even in like oh luther's gonna join the podcast i wish people could see this he's still (laughs) got a fucking bandage on one of his feet yeah (laughs) luther's had a hot spot on his paw for way too long months Uh, now anyway no one knows who that is uh no (laughs) it's a dope dog yeah (laughs) uh cute dopey dog but even in white noise, like Delillo is is mining some of these ideas that he's just bringing into like the whatever the fucking digital age here. It's like 
in white noise it was still like people people are uh there's like this um fuck what is it it's like the most photographed barn and on it's like this roadside attraction i think that i got that right or something like, like that a, and that so a real place i don't know if it's real i don't think so i think it's just like a sort of fake you know thought experiment kind of point that he's making where uh-huh. people end up wanting to go to take a photograph of the most photographed barn or something and mm-hmm. therefore contribute it to it being the most photographed and it's just this like feedback loop and that's what you're really there to see is like the place that's most photographed and you take a photograph of it so like yeah. it, you know it's just like from a prior like iteration of technology he's describing the same kind of thing where like an idea gets reified and i like that in, in, you know the aspect of like now that just causes um it just creates the reality right it's just like the the me- the postmodern point of like you know your awareness of your awareness I don't know, can still somehow create something genuine, but it's just born out of this meta perspective or meta perception. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, how does that rel- relate to this book, though? It's just like uh, now it's, I, I think he's just discussing that the kind of postmodern like meta perception of yourself watching yourself and dissociating from yourself just now with that there's computers basically is all yeah Mm -hmm. and there's a and there's a there's a couple scenes that really kind of hammer that home right like the the one that i just read earlier about him like watching his own heart on the on the kind of screen but there's another there's another one about where he like shows up on a big screen at the protest because one of the cameras was like trained on his car and he like sees himself and he kind of like sees his like mouth falling open in shock or whatever. And, 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 and there's like some implication that he like at one point had like a constant, like live feed of himself doing stuff. Yeah. Right. And that, and that the president has done that or is doing that also, which is sort of like uh, kind of an interesting kind of like precursor to like Twitch or whatever, I guess. Right. Just like, lot you know to, like a constant live feed of, of of your life that's not really explored yeah, he, a lot but it's like referenced a couple times it's referenced yeah. at the end when the killer finally catches up to him and he's talking about how he misses seeing eric meditate on his live stream basically right right he had like a meditation stream i wonder if he lived in uh uh roy thomer's cone oh. yeah <laughs> <laughs> just a camera on a big ring track that just can go around the top. I like, I mean, yeah. wasn't one of the most famous, like, you know, uh, wasn't there somebody who did that with their, like some girl with her dorm room or something like that? Like early on in the internet or something. Yeah. She just probably, like, fuck, she just had a 24 seven stream. She just, it, but it was like early, early fucking internet. It was like millions and millions of people saw this person. And yeah. uh, so it's like this famous case, like proto Twitch kind of only fan situation where, she wouldn't necessarily do anything. It, the camera was just on and it would take a right. still like every couple minutes. Like it well, wasn't there, even a video. <laughs> there was like a the guy. Show. There, yeah, Dreamer yeah, Girl. exactly. Yeah. There was a guy recently who, uh, who like this year, I think, who um, he was, a, he's a Super Mario 64 speedrunner, Japanese guy. Kano yeah, is his name. Shout outs to Kano. And he uh, said he was, he, he, he turned on a stream and said, I'm not turning the stream off until I break the world record for one of the categories in Super Mario 64 speedrunning. And he wound up streaming for like 3,000 hours or something. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just oh him. My like, God. Like, half of it was just his empty room when he was just like out doing things and him <laughs> sleeping and like, you know, that's yeah. Awesome. So, but so that I think that's interesting because that certainly I think was not really in the popular consciousness in 2003 as like a thing. I mean, right. I think we probably but, had like maybe Big Brother as a show by then. We I'm had not, surveillance. Exactly sure. Yeah. When did the Truman Show come out? Yeah. Truman Show. Reality. I, mean, I think Truman Show was definitely before that. I mean, like a Big Brother TV show. Just yeah. But so I definitely think there's some interesting kind of like prefigurative. Oh. Um, Truman Show was 98. Yeah. I think there was definitely some some interesting prefigurative stuff about surveillance and sort of like. 2000. Not, 2000 for um big brother straight up year okay. 2000 yeah, yeah yeah so that's interesting um but yeah and uh you even have you know his murderer 
is a decent like Benno he's, Levin. He's absolutely right. Fake nom de plume. Yeah. <laughs> but like fake name. He's got some lame name. His name's Kevin Sheets. <laughs> Kevin Sheets. Yeah, right. <laughs> reality, that's, is that is a, that's a real which name, is, right? yeah, yeah, it's just very funny when he finally said it. He's yeah. like, I'm bad, dude. He's like, I you know you're not. He's like, yeah. I'm Kevin Sheets. <laughs> I'm Kevin Sheets. <laughs> Which dude. that name made me laugh in a similar way to Joe Chip. Oh my god, so absolutely. Yes. It was a Philip K. Dick <laughs> yeah. level bad name. No, it's it's Richard Sheets. Fuck. I changed it to Kevin because yeah. I think that's a funnier name. Yeah, um, it is. Dick Sheets. Dick Sheets. <laughs> that's funnier. <laughs> now we're funny. Now again. we're fucking cooking with comedy gas, dude. But he he's like the parasocial psycho. Yes. Yeah. You know. He's well, like, he's he's dude, sort I of miss your fucking live streams, dude. I fucking love you. I want to yes. kill you. Well, he's <laughs> he, he's both sort of like the parasocial psycho and like disgruntled ex employee, like all wrapped into one kind of archetype, right? Yeah. Um, because he did work for Packers firm at some point. Um yes. but, he was covering you know, the bot, covering the, the, bot. the bot uh as a yeah. currency, and of course, Packer you know doesn't know who this guy is doesn't remember him at all doesn't know his name um and so yeah uh, it's it's i i thought that whole subplot was i, I thought the, i thought the ending was really bad i'll just put my cards on the table there like the scene with them in the room when sheets finally kind of you know gets him in the room where he's going to kill him um there was sort of like this interesting tension through the book of this like weird threat even though we see sheets is writing a little bit but packer's kind of reaction to it and his his bodyguard sort of constantly mentioning like hey there's this threat out here we got to go here we got to move or it, it, it was interesting up to a point but i i don't know it felt very like <laughs> i don't know it was very weird it felt very like tacked on almost in a way and like I, it's in some ways the main point of the story is this final confrontation between them, but it never felt like the point to me. I actually thought that was my favorite part of the book, actually. Yeah. The okay. end and everything to do with uh with with Kevin Sheets. That was like <laughs> the highlight of the book. Dick, for me. Dick Sheets. Um, Dick Sheets, baby. Dick. I don't know. I thought the end was uh it was there was some actual humor in there too, and they're kind of I mean the the dialogue is still disjointed and awkward, but I somehow got into the flow of it during those final scenes. And there's a there's a few funny parts where he mentions um, that his prostate is like irregular or, or asymmetrical. Yeah, that's another sort of subplot. Is, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Sheets was like, "So is mine." And he's like, "Really?" Well, yeah. I definitely. It was just. I, I forgot enough of the book to be like, "Is this going to be a Fight Club scenario?" I definitely was like, "Is he just? Is he Ben Eleven?" Like oh, I was. I, I I did go there in my head. I was like, "Is it going to be this?" So I'm glad it wasn't that at the very least. Yeah, and I didn't love it. It was just like it. Uh, it was better to me than the rest of the writing and the most of the other scenes just felt a little bit forced, like the um. We were talking before about the the flash mob naked uh group of like 300 people that end up being extras in a movie they're all like laying down in a section of a city and eric sees them and this is towards the end of the novel and he gets out and just like is kind of intrigued by the scene and uh ends up taking his clothes off and laying down in the crowd of people and it's i think it's supposed to be some sort of like scene about eric trying to regain a bit of his humanity and connect with people yeah um but it came across as like really forced to me and awkward and i just kept thinking of flash mob influences <laughs> and yeah sort of it, it, it almost felt like an arcade fire video like it, <laughs> it it's just like it just did not work for me at all yeah i i think you're right it it was a little heavy-handed for me like He's like he's reinserting himself into this mass of humanity, but there's still the like complicating factor of it being a film and therefore false. And there's like a lens going over people and like capturing it for some other reason. Yeah, it was a little weird. Yeah, there's one line in there that was nice where he said that like he he had the feeling like this was the most naked any of these people have ever been, which I thought was interesting. It's like all these people are. Yeah, they're all naked, but they're exposing themselves in such a broad, inclusive way. So I thought that was a good line in that scene. 
but uh, well, he's like overall. a sing- he's like this like uh, singularity guy, but he's like unsure of himself about that. Right, <laughs> he's like got that kind of Kurzweil hope to just be this um, floating consciousness on a disc and be pure information. Yes, <laughs> but, just like reducing reducing himself to data. But at the same time, you know, boy, does he indulge in a lot of physical acts and just like he's coming constantly he's yeah. eating like he's he's very like yeah like grounded in corporeality when he's actually doing things that seem to be enjoyable to him yes like he's constantly trying to like ground his physicality i think i thought that he was his like oh he's he just gets shocked too by his bodyguard that he asks her to shoot the her stun gun into I, his I, chest i thought that scene was really overdone and unnecessary like that was it reminded I, me of it's it was just like, leftovers. It was just like, oh, I, I just need oh, to feel yeah. I need to feel alive again. Shock me with a stun gun, make me calm. Like it was so stupid. Yeah. It, yes. it did remind me of left the leftovers, yeah. But it also reminded me a bit of like Quellbeck's perverse sex over overly mm-hmm. expressive sexual writing. And it, it came across as a little cringe. I just I need feel like anything for, to make me feel again. Ugh, oh god. But I feel like Eric yeah. is that kind of cringe potentially. Just I mean I could believe it for his character because like at the end of the day, right. He's like a 28 year old bro, like finance bro, autist genius. Right. I don't know. Like just like he could be doing some cringe shit like that. Um, You know, he's like, he's also like a a bodybuilder. Essentially. He's supposed to be like shredded. He, he mentioned his body fat percentage at at 5%. (laughs) Well, I, I, it kind of makes me think like we should maybe address, uh, in some ways what i think is like the 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 referential elephant in the room which is american psycho sure um yeah. because i think a lot of people on on reading this book you know not necessarily the plot of the book or the style of the writing or whatever but the the, the character of eric packer i think a lot of people's first thought is going to be um uh, american psycho yeah people said the you list these thing just because it takes place in like 24 hours but it's definitely got more of the feel of like american psycho to me which in, in that way also dates itself immediately too well and that book came out in like the early 90s right yeah, yeah. so yeah i don't know i i certainly delillo knew of that book and I, I just sort of wonder, like, w- what the intention was there. And he had to have known that this character he was writing was going to be kind of seen in the light of Patrick Bateman. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Right. But he just has violence done, like, basically. I, I, he still, yeah, likes the violence. He has it mostly done to himself. But he, he also, like, beats up somebody a little bit. And he kills his bodyguard. <laughs> he, yeah. That's but that's almost, like, scene, not a... Yeah. That's like an act of. That is the mo- that is like a kind of key scene. Um, yeah, but that's the haste in his death because there's also like the whole idea. He mentions the what is it? Was it Marx and Engels? Does he mention the fucking like cap or er, capitalism a, breeds the its own, its own destructors? It, yeah. Well, how, yeah, there's that, and there's also a reference to. Um, an anarchist thinker Bakunin Mikhail Bakunin where he talks about the the uh the destructive impulse also being a creative impulse that's a line directly from Bakunin okay um because I think Eric is like I think unlike American Psycho like I think Eric is he's trying to be like basically an avatar of capital or something like he he doesn't want to be a, a body anymore and there's oh yeah like we've mentioned earlier like there's all this stuff where he's like, I don't want to be a body. I want to be a machine. And then like, but he's also very much a body. He's getting fucking his prostate milked and, right, right. <laughs> you know, he's eating food and getting shocked. And the uh, prostate, the, 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 you know, the um, asymmetry of the prostate or whatever is sort of like this constant, I think, reminder to him that he's inevitably a body, right? Like he's inevitably imperfect and asymmetrical and, and weird and that that dr- drives him crazy to some degree right so the cringe message I, the, the message that kind of made me roll my eyes that i thought i was hearing a little bit was that it's okay to be weird <laughs> basically <laughs> and just let, let it's like it's kind of our flag fly 
it's kind of our flaws that make us human, don't you think? It's just like it was kind of that. Yeah, I'm the end for me I'm that I was like, uh, that's a little sense. The Joker blame. saying that. I don't even disagree, but it's just a you know I don't know. It just came off a little, a little lame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. That, one that of is the definitely a little lame. One of the lamest parts of the book. I don't know if you guys thought this was lame. Was the section where. Uh, there's like a rapper on the streets or something and dude kind of oh my god the fez. i have so much to yeah, say about so this. Bad. Uh, that's another early 2000s thing i think <laughs> it, 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 yeah it, to me it was like the lilo in like 1990 was walking down the street of new york city and saw someone break dancing and rapping with a boom box and was like i'm gonna write about that yeah and just it, made it's up this... his own lyrics so it's this oh, rapper... the actual lyrics Dude, why did he? Lyrics. Why did he write lyrics? That was so. Dude, I stupid. can't even. So bad. I'm gonna read one right now. I remember. Uh, Pinchin would have crushed this, by the way. Pinchin would have crushed this, though. So uh, wait, let, let me just give a little more context. So there's this rapper yeah, yeah. that is mentioned once or twice earlier on in the novel, where, like, in in one of the multiple elevators that Eric uses to leave his apartment, that are all automatically queued up to play certain music depending on his mood or whatever. One of them yeah. plays this rapper's tracks, whose whose name is Brother Fez, which yep. like first of all, no, oh, that's a yikes in and of itself. And he's he's supposed to be like what, like a like a Sufi, like Islamic mystic rapper who draws on those kind of like influences along with like street mm-hmm. culture or whatever. He's like, I think he was supposed to be like sort of like most deaf or something. Like he he like he's like a convert, but he's from the Bronx or something. Right, right, and and. One of the so culminating, one of the culminating sort of ending towards the end of the book, there's a scene where Eric kind of stumbles upon this guy's funeral procession. He just died, and Eric is shocked, and he starts crying. And he meets the guy's uh, a manager who he knew through, you know, he he owned some financial interest with the rapper and blah blah blah. Um, and it's one of these moments of him sort of being like human and like, when I die, no one's going to throw me a parade and they're just going to not even know that I die. And no one's going to be at my funeral. And oh my God, this guy touched so many lives. And, mm-hmm. and then the Lilo proceeds, which is not, which is kind of cringe in general. Okay. It's like, okay, we yeah. And then Delillo proceeds to, he made the choice. He woke up and made the choice to attempt to write some of this fictional rapper's lyrics. <laughs> yes. And, yeah. uh, yeah. Take I'm going to read Paul. my favorites. <laughs> Getting shot is easy. Tried it seven times. Now I'm just a solo poet working on my rhymes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, really bad. Woo! Kid used to think he was wise to the system. Prince of the street always do things his way. But he had a case of conventional wisdom. Never say nothing the others don't say. <laughs> wow, dude. <laughs> I just, I really, ho- I'm just picturing the Lilo at like, you know, 60 years old like, with got a do rag on, <laughs> <laughs> like writing this, trying to get in character. Oh, Let me be shit. who I was, unrhymed fuel that's lost but living. Wait, there's one really bad one. I can't. Oh. And Working there's so many. Rap. There's so many. He does. Like the first one is them. probably the worst one. Yeah, he really keeps it going. Oh, God, a oh man living high at last, sucking the tit melt. Tit milk of prayer and fast. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, you put this in a book, dude? Dude, oh, I, I, I wish this came with a, an accompanying album, and it's just a little like <laughs> that so would have been he's... epic. The little rapping, fucking... with brother Fez yeah. lyrics. <laughs> I... It's Donnie D with the <laughs> <laughs> that choice was inexplicable to me. I, yeah. I I have I have no I d- I don't know what the man was thinking when he's I th- I think he was just those. like he's like rap is like is like a dominant cultural influence and I got it he's like in his like sort of misunderstanding of it a bit I think he was like I got to include this I'm, I'm I'm going to do something about the contemporary world <laughs> it's just like he could have it was like still manageable but then the le- addition of the lyrics really just like this man right. really went and, and did this yeah. i yeah and that that's a tough for anybody like i can't even i can barely like i'm always like i get nervous even if like a good fucking highly super literary writer's like i'm gonna try my hand at like a poem now right i'm like 
I'm like, okay. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Let's see how this goes. Yeah. Audacity, but... I, I just, yeah. Like, just, you can just describe it. Describe the guy. Describe yeah. the guy. Yeah. Describe his style. You did not have to include lyrics, man. <laughs> yeah, it was one of those, like, I, I do plan on reading more DeLillo because I want to just, like, you know, read more of him. And people have talked about him being a great writer. But that was that that I had a moment reading those passages where I was like, do I really want to? <laughs> <laughs> is this too far? Yeah. Uh, it was, it, that was a, a tough, that was a tough row, row to hoe for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I wasn't really sure. Like, I don't know. I summarized a little bit what I thought the function of that scene was, but I, what did you guys make of that scene? And the, the, the sort of rapper as this figure in general, was it was it just sort of like a a sense of like um, Eric's like own meaninglessness in his life that he's never going to like touch these people, the other people. He's never going to have this connection. Like, w- was that it or was there more, some other reason? Was there more to it? That's kind of all I got out of it was that like there's this other person living in the same city I live in that is doing something completely different than what I do. And then the funeral scene is just like hitting that same point harder in just being like i am not this person i'm missing something in my life by not being with these types of people or you know brother fez is getting a a big pharaonic kind of send off to the like processions pretty huge i mean there's all these like processions that are they're happening uh but yeah i don't know i i I agree with you and paul i think it's just sort of like my mortality and, and what is you know what what is the uh like I don't want to die, and I know that if I do now, like none of this pomp and circumstance, I'm ultimately like, yeah, just just a memento mori thing. What you guys? What do you guys think of the scene where he finally gets to the barber, and uh, he's cutting his the barber's cutting his hair? I forget his name. Uh, uh, so the, his through. driver's name is Ibrahim, but I forget Arthur. The, Arthur is the barber. I think. Right? Yeah. Arthur this is another talking about his like his life living in like a tiny apartment with like one window or two windows and then he starts talking about how he uh used to love driving his cab around you know before he was a barber like his whatever and then they started talking about like everywhere he w- he would pee i liked that yeah i thought that was okay i i just thought it was a little too overbearing like the point was just like like the stupid phrase everyone shits like even the queen of england shits or whatever i thought it was a little bit of like i don't know what the point of it was other than that like well, same I with the was... uh the prostate point it was just like this is my body everyone has body is ip yeah I, I think that was part of it it was more more on this theme of <laughs> more on this theme of like embodiment and and corporality and all of that and these and, two men have a connection about where they pee and it's like right you know, but that's it's about- so surface level and dumb and boring and lame. <laughs> I mean, that's fine. Yeah. But every- yeah. Yeah. Peas, I hate it. Uh, well, it's like, sorry. you know, because the, the, there's like the, yeah, another theme is like, does he want to live forever? Does he want to even be a body? Like, right. How, how, you know, I don't think Eric, you know, Eric's only real like physical connection is like either with people he's beating up or having sex Fucking. with fucking with these people who he's kind of almost just sort of contractually has power over in ways even if it's marriage uh yeah so i don't know like when like he like his first sexual encounter is like he gets his prostate milked and he cooms right uh he just while his uh that other lady is like is she fucking yourself with a water bottle i think that's the implication yeah or or at at least touching herself yeah, that's the implication. <laughs> uh, so yeah, like the big thing of like you know he has they both coom and and don't touch. And yeah, then, I don't know. Yeah, you know it's just like I think he's just hammering a point in different ways of like human connection. I um, being tied to body stuff, but also right not. for sure. Right, it's that it's that, I, and I think that's one of the other major themes of the book is like corporality versus like digital like you said, Matt, like the sort of digital singularity idea. And like, are we, 
ever going to you know get there? Do we want to get there? What's what does it mean for for corporality and and the, the sort of unavoidability of corporality, right? Like I think you were right to point out the the significance of the various scenes where he's eating and he's like just constantly hungry it seems through the yeah, book yeah <laughs> and like he's just every time he eats he just winds up eating like a fuck ton and he like steals his his wife's food like every time <laughs> they eat which is like two or three times over the course of the book um and I, I, I mean, I kind of want to come back and talk about the, the his wife and the food and the eating scenes and the different restaurants they go to also. But just because we were talking about the, the barber scene for a minute, um, I, I don't know about you guys, but like the fact that the barber scene. So I, I read it as Arthur. And I don't know if this is ever stated specifically, but I assume that that the way that it's written, that Arthur is is a black man. Did you guys assume that or, or no? I did not. You didn't. I didn't. Okay. I didn't really. The Ibrahim is, but I Ibrahim certainly didn't think is. about any race at all. I'm. I was. I was that woke. I was, I was, I was, I was, <laughs> well, it's also like. Race. Well, well it's here, also like in this why, book. Like the reason I did assume that is because that scene happens very shortly after the the funeral scene with Brother Fez, and then he goes to like the barber shop is a you know, feature, a prominent feature of black culture, black literature, black music. It's and, also in like a really bad neighborhood. And it's right? in a very bad neighborhood where the guy yeah. has a gun and they talk about it being sort of in, in, in like a tenement, like basically in a project area and that it's dangerous to be outside alone at night. So I kind of right. assume like there was a moment where I almost wondered like, is Eric black even, you know? And and and, and I, I I don't think that his race is ever explicitly specif specified. That at is the, true. At the end of the day, I don't think he is. But I I wondered that for a minute in the barbershop scene because I assumed that Arthur was black. And then it just sort of got me thinking about like Delillo's engagement with black culture here because of the rapper and the barbershop. And I I just wondered how that fit into the bigger picture. And maybe that's maybe I'm reading too far into it, but. I mean, in Underworld, there's some there's a significant black character, and like uh, I don't know, the levels from the Bronx. I don't know, right? You know, but he uh, have uh, commented on the casting of of uh, what's his name, Robert, Robert Pattinson. Pattinson. Yeah, yeah maybe Pattinson maybe is throwing me for filming. a loop. Yeah, but I mean, even you know, listen, we're gonna talk about Harry Potter at the end, everybody. I know you're <laughs> you, you listen to the whole thing to hear that at the very end. But there's like that whole thing about like Hermione being black, right? That, yeah, like, yeah. And, you know, it's just like they're made up too. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. But I don't know. I think when there is a person of a specific race in this book, it tends to be ex also explicitly mentioned. That's true. Like, uh, you know, his bodyguard's black. That's immediately made apparent, like uh, the one he has sex with and gets tased by. So yes. The track record is if you're she's not basically white, you're... she's basically Tessa Thompson from the Thor movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good for Eric. Uh, so yeah, I, I got the sense that Arthur was like old, old uh, European or something. Okay, yeah, or like a, or Italian or something like that. Yeah, like old. Uh, yeah, it's. Just, it, I just thought. It, I mean, I think this that in and of itself is interesting that that we we read it really different ways. And it has yeah. sort of different impl different potential implications for the way you read other parts of the book. Um, because, yeah, I, I and I also just sort of I guess I also just sort of thought that the kind of like intuitive, like natural connection that that Ibrahim and Arthur have was potentially partially because they're both people of color. Uh, sure. Yeah. Also, as a, as a sort of implied thing. Um, but I don't know. Do you guys remember exactly where the barbershop was supposed to be? It's, it's I mean, it's, it was, it's right where Eric grew up. His dad used to take him there when they were younger. Was it West, in West was Side it somewhere in Manhattan? Yeah, they stayed on Manhattan the whole time. I think. Yeah, I mean, I don't know enough about the uh, gentrified history of New York City, but I, I found it unrealistic to at, at that point of time in the year two thousand that like because Manhattan's like so safe now. I mean, I, I was just like, was it really that unsafe in thousand? I know that like there's areas of the of Brooklyn that are still to this day like kind of dangerous, but not the even rest that of New York City, yeah. So I, it 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 seemed like a like it was an out of touch geographical feature. I thought Matt, even the Matt, lower... you're the you're the guy to you're the guy to ask, Matt. 
I don't know. In in 2000, it could have still, but also, yeah, I don't know. Like from where I thought they were, which is like the lower west side or something. Like, um, it's kind of there's a stretch of that that's pretty empty. But um, but are it, there, didn't, there, I didn't, it didn't really even make sense as a residence. Like that's where there's I was not like, really like public housing on Manhattan anywhere, is there? Like except maybe up 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 far north Manhattan. Yeah, there's a couple of clusters of of old public housing. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's it's none, none of its the way bad. it was I don't described. Think it was bad though, in 2000. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what that was my general thought. And like the way uh, Arthur describes it, like he's like, you don't have a gun, like you need a gun to go out on these streets at this yeah, point. Right. Yeah. I don't it, know it was like that. Delillo had never been to New York City, which is not where she's from. <laughs> yeah, where he's from, from. It was and where weird. again in that interview he was like. Uh, you know, I always have to create a strong sense of place in my books, you know, so <laughs> like Very if he weird. failed there, I mean, he knows where stuff is, but yeah, <laughs> they're just in Times Square. Like they're just like, they kind of go west and then I think they go and then they either go up or down on the west side somewhere on Manhattan. I think they go it would up, be, it would be upper west side is not even that bad. It would be interesting to try to do a little like a detailed mapping of the route they take in the book. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you could. Do a little uh, Bloomsday yeah. walking tour yeah, yeah, exactly. of New York City. You get to go through Times Square and then yeah. <laughs> along the West Side Highway. <laughs> exactly. Sucks ass. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you get you get a little bit of biographical information too, like the 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 smattering that's also I think there to sort of you know give him a psychological kind of motivation. Where with the classic like you know his dad dies from cancer or something, and right. Then, He's got a kind of like uh, reserved uh, withholding mother, single mom that raises him. And uh, yeah, you're supposed to be like, oh, that's sad. Yeah, I can see why Eric has a billion (laughs) dollars. Yeah. And he wants to go get his hair cut at this like, uh, I don't know, this touchstone of like his family is a weird sentimental gesture that didn't feel it, it felt out of place in his characterization. It like didn't a, really a hit for me, people. I'll say. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's all in, in like, like the big, the big underlying kind of catalyst for stuff is, is this, he's, what is he doing? He's betting against the yen and he bets against the yen. He's like leveraged everything yeah. in his and- entire you know, uh, value of to just against the yen and he, he fucks up and he, and he's, I guess he's completely got zero dollars by the end of the book. <laughs> yeah. Right. It is. It is. I did like that subplot where it's like, yeah. yeah, the, the, his whole kind of, you know, position, I guess is the term they use in finance. It, you know, his position is all fucking tied up in the yen, not going up and it keeps right. going up and keeps going up. And eventually he, loses essentially all of his money i think like you said he's got <laughs> fucking zero dollars and he just kind of has a breakdown and and kills his bodyguard um which maybe we should so, read some of that scene and then he ultimately fucking so his wife is kind of like old money like right born into a rich family and they've, they've always been rich and he, you know he's kind of like the new tech finance billionaire guy and he just hacks into her phone and just loses all of her money on purpose too <laughs> I thought that was fucking funny. <laughs> yeah. He just has to like anything he can get his hands on. His wife takes it pretty in stride. Yeah, his her his wife is has a good attitude towards She's her. like, I'm hereditary aristocracy. I'm all good. You're fucked. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, she's, right, right. She's pretty Chad in general. Yeah, she's like, Well, I don't know. Well, we should maybe talk about the wife a little bit. Um and their kind of interactions, right? So it's her what's her name we never do we do we land on it it's elise right elise Schifrin. elise yeah something like uh, that and and she's uh old money we don't know how her family got their fortune but um you know and they sort of married as a you know not quite an arranged marriage but as a sort of like this makes sense sort of thing you're a new rich guy i'm an old rich lady um but like they don't really know each other at all right like he even when he sees her on the street, it sometimes takes him a few seconds to even recognize her, right? Like, oh, that's my wife, Elise, <laughs> Elise Schifrin. And he calls her by her full name, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, the the big sort of, and they meet up sort of in these random ways uh, throughout the book. Like she's at the, 
he winds up meeting her at the naked film scene that she's kind of somehow wound up at and he meets her yeah. sort of standing outside of a, a club at one point when he's going driving by and i mean have all these felt and, like and, and the big thing theatrical yes yes it felt like a stage play like enter wife <laughs> yes right for sure yeah and and like the big um sticking point i guess between them or for 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 eric i guess specifically is that they don't have sex enough which and they've is, been together it, for two weeks right which is funny because yeah. he has sex so much in the rest of the book. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but he he but 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 he doesn't feel like he's having sex enough with his wife and she's like dude chill i don't know why you're making such a big deal out of this we'll 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 have yeah. some sex eventually like we're busy we're rich i don't really know you that well yeah, that's yeah fine. like yeah. we'll have sex eventually <laughs> Um, and he's just a coomer, and he's just like, just like no, constantly dude, I going coom. to the hotels cooming yeah <laughs> so yeah matt we were just talking about the wife and how the kind of the main sticking point between them is the amount of sex they have uh for for eric anyway and how also her paul made a good point that her sort of appearances feel like theatrical almost in the in the in the literal sense of like enter stage right like wife uh, at, right. standing at the corner of the club or whatever yeah i didn't know what to make about her like being sort of somebody he will often not immediately recognize yeah she's just such a new presence in his life but like still he's got like aphasia or not aphasia what's agnosia yeah agnosia i think visual form agnosia maybe yeah something where like she's she's sort of a like abstract familiar form before she concretizes into like a human uh that he knows and then he's kind of like he looks at her very proprietarily like too not that she's like you know weep not for this person but she's at least human and i think that's her her ultimate role is to be you know she's uh she's got unattainable amounts of wealth that no normal person would ever really see but at the same time she's still like at least kind of feels some stuff and she's a poet and uh there's another thing about poetry like he says he reads poetry every morning yes i don't know what to make of that makes him aware of his breathing as he says which is a line i kind of liked um but anyway, yeah, she's just I think she's just like the gooey human uh, to his mind, essentially, or whatever. Yeah. But I don't know why she's like this phantom that flows in and out. I, I mean, want to read because you just mentioned the poetry thing. Let me just read this yeah, segment please. on 68. Um, this is when he uh, it might be her his their first meeting. I'm not sure. It might be their second one. Yeah. Um, she was Elise Sheffrin, his wife, reading a book of poems. He said, recite to me. She looked up and smiled. He knelt on the step beneath her and put his hands on her ankles, admiring her milky eyes above the headband of the book. Where is your necktie? She said, had my checkup, saw my heart on screen. He ran his hands up her calves to the rills behind the knees. I don't like saying this, but you smell of sex. That's my doctor's appointment. You smell. I smell sex all over you. <laughs> it's what? It's hunger you smell. He said, I want to eat lunch. You want to eat lunch. We're people in the world. We need to eat and talk. Another uh, display of just awkward dialogue as well. There's almost like that whole, like, also, like, the way that's phrased, it's like, it's also almost that, like, annoying, affected, um, I'm quirky and awkward. Yeah. Like, almost like a indie, old indie movie kind of thing where it's like, what? I guess we're like people or whatever. Like, should we like get a sandwich or what do people do? Like, well, and it's just yeah. like, shut up. Oh God. I, there's like, I guess a we like particular scene in a movie. I'm thinking of where that happened. I guess we're like, talking about like, like this right now or whatever. <laughs> it's it, like, it's uh, in a trailer for Juno or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's hundred <laughs> percent. Like, let's just like, well, people we should get lunch now. <laughs> yeah. We yeah, should. A title card. Sex. Yeah. I guess we're like a couple or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, which is a very strange i mean it's not strange because it's written in 2003 but it's weird that that somehow influenced the writing and the dialogue in this book <laughs> for delillo like through delillo it's just it's an odd a manifestation i think he's just kind of <laughs> accidentally backed his way into it through his own writing style basically like he didn't mean to but it just happened and i was starting to read it that way it's like I guess we're eating salads now, like a freaking a couple. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I but, think uh, I think. Oh, Elise... can I just read one line yeah, later? Please. Like it's on the same page that I absolutely hated. Again, I should have underlined. There's so many, but I I only really underlined one. 
Uh, he says, I'm not sure how hungry I am. Eat, you'll find out, he said. Speaking of sex, we've been married only weeks, barely weeks. Everything is barely weeks. Everything is days. We have minutes to live. I fucking hate yeah, it so yeah. much. Yeah. We have minutes to live. That was a cringy. Like, what are you talking about? And it's, yeah. it, again, it's sort of like that, you know, it's thematic in the sort of sense of the book and like the, the collapsing of the future into the present and blah, 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 blah. Um, right. But still cringy in the context of that. Of that you know scene. what it basically was? It's that song. I'm in love with you tonight. For all we know, there might not be tomorrow. Same. Yes. Sentiment. Yes. But well, that's a good song. <laughs> that is a good. Yeah, song. that song slaps. But you know, it's not a. That song has no pretensions of uh, making commentary. It's just like y'all at the club and you should fuck now. <laughs> yeah. And we're gonna peer pre- pressure your friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're on drugs yeah um, yeah exactly and there is a there is a club there's a there is a uh speaking of clubs there is a club scene in this book that i also kind of thought was cringe which uh, he he winds <laughs> again up with, early 2000s man right. just like a club with lasers you just see the matrix again or something it's just like, right and he's just standing above like like oh look at all these young people on their drugs like it's like beautiful and depressing and the music and they're dissociating, but they love it. Is this, is this the truth? Is this humanity? Is this happiness? Like, bleh! Uh, yeah. Uh, awful. Yeah. I just, I just, yeah, again, it's just, just yet another artifact of the time that it was written that just did not fucking hit for me. And the, the one interesting wrinkle to that though, is like, um, one of the grounding elements that I liked is that, like, every time that, like, Donko, what is the name of the dude that owns the club? Don, Donka. Well, he doesn't own it. He's his other bodyguard, right? No, I think he's, uh, isn't he the club owner? Former bodyguard or associate or something? Oh, is his former bodyguard? Okay, I don't remember. Don Donk, I, don't, I think I don't it is remember. Donka or Donko or something like that. Some Some vaguely Eastern European name, which he comments on in the book. And again, he he hits this too hard with like uh, Ibrahim and stuff, but like the like there is at least that grounding thing of like every time there's somebody like this who's like a business owner that Eric meets. Eric himself is not like this, but there's like a wound or a scar or like some physical thing to like be like this was kind of like ground like this emerged out of very like again corporeal like tactile violence right. like there was a, a material basis through from which like this idea that everything's immaterial emerged from and it's like not nice <laughs> it's like right you know it's it's people in like war turn you know middle eastern and european countries with like missing eyes and limbs and stuff and, like, well and there's that good scene early on that that sort of references that matt like that same kind of theme where he sees on the news that one of his not like a business rival but like another guy in the same business that he kind of like begrudgingly oh, respects a russian guy gets a russian caught. guy who is like a who's like assassinated outside of his um i forget the term they use in the book uh oh, but it's daca it's some, DACA, DACA or whatever yeah it's some distinctly like Russian term and he comments on how like the news like reiterating that he was shot outside of his DACA or outside of his Russian home it's like a way of emphasizing the like distance of it that it's like trying mm-hmm. to make it less real um I thought that was an interesting an interesting sort of little scene but again sort of like that that the, the grounding violence of corporate corporeality of it right but you know it's it's like there's this is the thing right this is this book why this book was a little disappointing and kind of in in 2021 also like uh even even some of the insights feel a, a little stale it's like um fuck i, I kind of lost my my thread damn that blew away fast yeah you were right in the middle I'm of get, it i'm old we should we i'm gonna we, die the, the i want to just be information dude <laughs> the lesson is we just need to do this show drunk yeah <laughs> coffee doesn't what do happened? it for us Matt was like literally had just started making a point and instantly was like, I forget what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> he was literally the like, five, now. like five words into it. Um, you need to get an I Elon just, Musk. We were talking about the Russian your, uh, guy that's assassinated. Diaphragm. I guess my, my I get, vaguely, I was just thinking like, it's just, it's like for every like kind of well phrased uh, uh, or, or interesting idea broached, which it that's, you know, a lot of books do that. Right. You, yeah. you can have a cool idea, but 
but then it's yeah it's just stuff like the rapping and like uh just a weird like almost like quirky dinner date and some super heavy-handed stuff it, there's enough of that that mitigates it that it just it creates overall a somewhat uh yeah just kind of corny and dated ex- reading experience it, it, it is flat. Weirdly corny. it's very flat yeah well i mean i can't help i can't deny that he he attempted he was very ambitious i would say mm. i can't deny him that like he he from what I gather about his prior works, he was kind of maybe writing in his what he felt comfortable with. Is that kind of fair, Matt? I, um, I guess. I mean, yeah, he was always been obsessed with like, I guess, technology's effect on people. So there's that. Yeah. But I mean, he, yeah, he just falls flat in so many instances. I mean, and some things like some lines even came across as like lazy to me or just maybe just old man uh not thinking um like he he refers to a, a space gun or no he says ray gun at one point remember that and i i read that i forget the what in what context it was but i read that i was like ray gun it's just like what they would say in 1960 talking well, about Star I, Trek. Like, I, I think one of the things about that, though, at least say I, I laser gun. I don't remember the ray gun specifically, but but one of the one of one of the preoccupations of of Packer as a character is with like the obsolescence of language and like how language is right. never never really catches up with the future. And that may be an instance of that in in Delillo writing the book as well, just in a sort of like meta way. You know, like there's, I, I mean, there's a ton of these examples, but the one that I remember is uh, he gets really pissed about police referring to their hand radios as walkie talkies. And, and he oh, like, yeah. talks about how like stupid it is that, that we still use that term. And uh, that's literally a Brian Regan bit. Is it? Yeah. So like, what are we going to do? Call guns, Rudy Tooty point and shoot oh, us. <laughs> the fucking military is so dumb and whimsical. <laughs> sounding. Oh, that's funny. The thing about that, though, is that it's like impossible to uh, to judge what f- turns of phrases and what terms will stick. Like we were talking about Jewel and how we, you know, we predict that maybe vape pens will just be called jewels, like Kleenexes are referred to as tissues or whatever. But it's like it's it's impossible to know, really. And that it, that can date your your fiction. Maybe he is trying to make a meta commentary on that, but still in the reading experience, it comes across as off-putting and yeah. dated. Well, he's, I, I was, this is, this is part of like the uh, Ben Eleven chunks, which I agree with you, Paul. Like I found that maybe it's weird. It's like the, the supposed ramblings of a madman. I'm like, yeah, no, I get that. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, that's, that's why I like the Paul, most. That's why they reminded me so much of Paul Oster. Like that's, that's but all I, Paul Oster. He was just, uh, this is him, and this is apropos, like, this is just sort of describing Eric. He says, he is always ahead, thinking past what is new, and I'm tempted to admire this, always arguing with things that you and I would consider great and trusty additions to our lives. Things wear out impatiently in his hands. I know him in my mind. He wants to be one civilization ahead of this one. Which, you know, pretty good line characterization yeah. of, like, you know, like, that kind just the kind of person even that like eric kind of represents even now well, and, yeah and i think in in eric there's like this i kind of want to talk about uh ben 11 slash dick sheets a little bit more okay. too but um sure. but i i think it, it, there's like this tension in eric and i think this is probably meant to be a commentary on you know where delillo sees society going in general between between and again, I don't think this is particularly insightful of Jesus now with the backgrounds. <laughs> is that Will um, Smith? Oh, God. <laughs> uh, Will Smith is Neo. Yeah. Um, <laughs> between this sort of like very like worldly, like right, the cosmopolitan, which is in, in Cosmopolis, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of kind of modern globe trot, this and that. But but the the more that that part of in, of people gets expanded the more it also kind of like funnels into like solipsism too right yeah it, it, sort of the more cosmopolitan you are the more individualistic you are also so it's like this weird hourglass filtering um and i don't really know what to make of that but that that sort of made me think of it what you were just 
talking about. Well, it can't be much too far away from the also, you know, somewhat obvious observation of like, if if the, like you know, like the way I was saying, he, he looks at Elise like she's a a, a purchase, right? She, he's like not the hottest, but like good bang for my buck, like really, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, right. like you know, and fucking like whatever, good prestige with her name, all that kind of stuff. Like the idea, uh, fucking Fight Club, dude. Don't let you, the things you own own you or whatever, right? Which is like what ends up happening and it's like a shit of like if you're cosmopolitan it's like you have refined taste but uh it's still a list of usually consumer like consumables that you end up having it's just like a personal list of them right and, uh yeah it's it all emanates from you there's no community around that it's like my carved out little atomic space within this place filled with other people with quote-unquote good taste and you know classy habits and shit right and yeah. also just like you know uh th it expands out to like financial models and stuff too though right like the solipsism of of um trying to like map everything and like this the, the cycles of money fluctuation and trying to map that onto like you know eric has these grand ideas of like finding patterns in biology and physics that will allow him to never have to guess again and just it's like kind of like pie the movie pie yes that's actually Great. a good reference point yeah i think like that's an interesting know reference now. point right and that point there is no future right it's like you know you're you're god emperor dune you're right. like fucking, yeah <laughs> you've 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 that's the singularity right yes exactly the matrix <laughs> which, I was build, wondering, which build, build does eric take uh, oh no, i'm kidding Probably, the red Probably pill. you think he's. I think he's red pilled initially, and then he takes the blue pill. Yeah, he wants to get back to. He ends up taking. He ends up taking the blue pill. Yeah, to become to to re re sort of go back to his humanity. He wants to uh, immaculate back to humanity. Yeah, yeah. Once he fucked up on guessing what the yen would do, he was like, "Ah, what am immaculate? even? Am well, because I, it, I right, gotta go that, back to he, 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 right, right. It's true that does sort of like shatter his entire sense of self identity, right? And then he just kind of like, what do you make of him like losing his wife's money on purpose? Like, I, I, I found that to, like uh, he talks at one point about having like boyish notions of deviousness mm -hmm. um, when he's talking about like how he he like wants to love his wife and also cheat on his wife. Um, and I, it, uh, to me, it also relates to his desire to be like sexually punished, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, just like feeling bad in any which way and having his wife feel bad and like doing harm to his wife too all makes him feel better in a perverse way right and probably just the like you know if we, neither of us have have the the money which is the number which is the value you know like are we still do you still love me you know even right I, right yeah it's like one of those things you talk as like you hear couples like if I was like yeah but what if I was like ugly and poor and I had one of my arms was actually an earthworm right Would you still right. love me <laughs> like yeah. one of those things well it's yeah it's like now you're just talking about the fucking uh, the that Adam Levine feature on that that one song like if I got locked away and I run out today <laughs> tell me honestly. <laughs> Would you still love me? Say, like, you know, that song, it's like that. It's yes. Like, yeah. It's so funny because it's like you're basically a different person. No, it's no, like, no, what if no, I no. looked totally different and my name was different and you didn't know me and I was a different <laughs> yeah. human being? Right. You never met. Would you love like, me? Well, then you weren't, you wouldn't, you're not you. <laughs> right. Would you love me still? But I think Eric well, is like, he, he talks like, about I'm it doing... in, those, in those terms, oh. like when he does it, right? He's like, oh, we're going to strip ourselves down to the raw nakedness. And then they literally are naked together later. It's like, yeah, oh, yeah right. This is exactly a little right. too obvious for me. Yeah. It's like supposed to be an intimate act, I think, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's not theft in the in the straightforward sense. Mm -mm. But she's like, it doesn't matter. She just waltzes out of there. And I think yeah. that's true. I think there is a little bit of that, like the different type of money and how they differently see things, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I did like, think that was fine. I think I, I do think her reaction is telling. And she, of course she couches it in like a, in like a sort of um, 
oh who cares life is just about like love and art and money is whatever exactly. whatever but like yeah. at the end of the day you know like that old money it doesn't really matter like yeah you can disappear a few million of my dollars and or even a couple hundred million but it doesn't right. really matter <laughs> Because he talks about how it's like he has so much money that he finally like sees her bank account. And he's like, I almost wanted to laugh. This is like a silly number to even say. It's so small. It's like right. $700 million. Right, right. <laughs> or it's like, no, it's only like 250 mil. And he's like, fuck. Uh. But then, you know, yeah, like the, one of it's probably like she's still got a more secure place in the world yes. than he ever will. And it, and it speaks to like his all of his he's got more money than her, but it also disappears in a day because of the yen fluctuation and right you know you get the sense that like her my sorry my dog is just shaking his dick and his collar like all in front of me right now it's loud um lie down dude um but you do get the sense that like her her money is this so like self-generating like like perpetual motion machine you know what i mean right that, like is you, oh, yeah okay it doesn't matter you disappeared 300 million dollars like okay that's fine we'll get it back in in a week or whatever and it's just always churning and there and so i do think that that scene was an interesting kind of commentary on like the different um like valences of wealth in modern society yeah i was also thinking about there's this book i've been meaning to read so i can't really comment further than just i wonder there's a book called uh an engine not a camera it's like a book about how financial models shape the market itself. Um, you know, cool. just one of the one of those deep dives about how like, yeah, that I think this book is also trying to sort of tap into of like, you're an expert, you claim you claim something, and it, and it makes the thing true at least on paper and within the like, you know, stock market. And right. You're an expert. That means that. Means that you're banking on the future, right? It's like you, yes. you're, you're bank. You're, you're like, a broker, Harry. Yeah, <laughs> <That'd be fun. laughs> you're a. <laughs> you just get some. Yeah, you're on Wall Street now, Harry. Yeah, Hogwarts <laughs> will get you open some doors for you. Dude. Yeah, <laughs> but that's I'm also like, a wizard. That's like a well established. That's like a well established thing. These guys that run these these huge hedge funds, they, you know, they go on CNBC on a show or whatever. And they just like mention a stock, you know, and, that they like, and that because of their mentioning it, it goes up, not because of anything right. yeah. in the nature of the business or the nature of the product or the nature of the company or whatever. It's because they mention it. And they, of course they know that and they do it on purpose. Right. Which is, yeah. which is why, you know, it, I thought it was really funny that, um, the one of the re like rallying cries of the like GameStop Reddit people, uh, which of course they were they were acute. You, you guys all remember this, right? The, the game, yeah, of course, yeah. the Robin Hood thing, yeah, Robin Hood thing on Reddit, and of course they were accused by the sort of like financial elites on on CNBC or whatever of like you guys are manipulating the markets and da 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 da. And of course their response, like their sort of rallying cry, was we just like the stock. And and that's yeah. a reference to the fact that that's actually how the stock market works in a lot of ways, because you have these powerful people who just get out and say, well, I like this stock. Well, you liking the stock now makes it more valuable right. in and of yeah. itself. Right. Yeah. And yeah. that's and it's just that's the ludicrousness of the scenario, <laughs> basically, because, you know, what are the, the, the Gabe, you'd, we'd watch that same interview when that whole shit was popping off about like stock market just being uh, like the mood, the mood like a mood ring measurement yes. for like yes. various rich people essentially. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, sad. And again, that's sad. All that stuff is so now like comically in your face. And that's I think, why this the subtleness of this book feels almost needless as well. Yeah. And I think Delillo like, you know, comp like it, competently like ably captures that in a way, but it's not like the force is just not there for me at this point. And, 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 you know, maybe we could probably argue for hours about like how much of that is DeLillo's fault. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. versus just like the world moving past this book, but yeah, I would venture, I would say the latter a little bit more so, but also this is just, this just feels like a little bit weak. Like I think DeLillo 
I don't know. He seems unsure of himself or something. Mm. And there's a lot of like j- just philosophical gesturing to make up for it. Yeah. I think this book needed more sci-fi elements. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. It needed an Elon Musk type type figure to to like plant a, a musk seed into his uh asymmetrical whatever it's called. Prostate. One thing Prostate. one thing that I will say. Gross. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Horrific. Musk seed. A- e- e- Elon, not- <laughs> Jeff, Jeff Bezos just launching his fucking cock rocket into this guy's prostate. Into Eric's asshole. Yeah. <laughs> that would be epic. Uh, yeah. But I will this say, okay, in, in terms of sci-fi elements, one thing that I will say is that I do think, especially at the beginning of the book, Delillo does a good job of um, kind of making. Like, I kept forgetting that the book was set in 2000. Like, I kept thinking that it was set even a couple years in the future from now because some of the stuff yeah. to me, either because I'm just not rich and I didn't know it was a thing or like whatever, it did feel sort of futuristic. Like, the lining your limo with like cork or whatever, like all, yeah, all of these, all of these like weird, like, which, which is a bad example potentially because that's actually probably very low tech to do just stuff it with cork <laughs> but but like oh, there's a lot of descriptions of things that that had to you know, i guess were around then that seemed still futuristic to me reading it today so i thought that was a interesting kind of like strength of delilah's description yeah he does do he does feel like he he lives in the future and i you could see where like that almost delusion in some sense can take hold if you're rich enough. I mean, obviously yes. like being, being certain levels of wealthy just place you <laughs> in the rarefied atmosphere of just complete otherness to other people, right. like most people where you're like, no, I can actually, you know, I, even Will Smith, <laughs> like just like his family is just like, we're God, we're God. Yeah, we're uh, God people. <laughs> is, isn't, yeah. um, isn't Will Smith still like to this day, somehow like the richest actor or like, the most, or, or like the most, or like the there was a while, even like five or ten years ago, or something, where Will Smith was actually like commanded the highest price per movie in Hollywood. That huh. I could see that being true. Yeah, I don't know. If Which that's is true like anymore. low, very low key. Like if you ask me, like who is the most expensive actor to hire in Hollywood, I don't know that I would have organically thought of Will Smith. Like I think I knew that factoid, but I don't think I would have organically thought of it. Yeah, my I thought I heard that uh, Larry David was. I mean, I'm looking at a list now that's probably you know stupid, but Jerry Seinfeld's number one and uh, Bill Cosby is number five. That can't be right. Seven. What? <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? It's <laughs> a funny list. Are you are you looking at a list of like hiring Will comedians Smith is for your number birthday 20. or something? People with <laughs> problematic sexual pasts. What are you looking at? <laughs> Michael Douglas, 18. This is a wrong list. There's yeah. no possible way Jerry Seinfeld Bill, has the highest fee for... Are these people who've hit some sort of momentary peak like at it, a, it, a point adjusted for inflation or something? Yeah, like right, it says right, net, right. It says net worth. Oh, that's different. Uh, I mean, I mean, like, how much they get paid, like, per movie. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Uh, anyway, this is that. neither here nor there. The point being, like, you could see, like, how uh, you could just believe that this is, like, what's inevitably happening for everybody at some point. The, right. Because you live in, you know, a, you have a gliding, you know, space limousine with uh, with all these amenities. And you're like, I am. In the, it is the future. Right. I am in the future. <laughs> this is what's happening. Well, and, and th- th- there's a couple, like, good lines and good moments with that sort of thing. Because, again, right, like, the one of the other themes about the book of the book is the sort of like collapsing or the sort of like violent intrusions of the future into the present and the way that the future sort of controls our present in a lot of ways, even though it's absent. So it's sort of like this postmodern kind of like one of these postmodern turns of phrases, right. That gets used a lot is like the absent present or, you know, the, 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 so on and so forth. And I think the future is sort of like that role uh, in this book. Um, But uh i forgot where i was going with that but uh yeah well eric does it's it's like sort of indicated that eric does have uh, the ability to kind of significantly through technology see his own future 
Yes, right. And that's kind of how the book ends too. He's like, he sees his death and you got your little, you know, uh, whatever, uh, spinning, spinning top, does it fall over or not moment, but the yeah. end of the book. But. Right, right, right. It, end, it ended on a very cringy note for me because of that inception. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't even make that connection until you guys just brought it up. It's a pretty weak connection. <laughs> well, so so at the so so let's just let's just get the spoilers done here. So the, at the end of the book, he winds up in the room with dick sheets and yeah, uh, dick sheets. <laughs> dick sheets. <laughs> and they go through this long. I mean, the, one of the other cringy things about the ending that I hated, just these <laughs> dumbass lines of like dick sheets being like, "I wanted you to heal me. Like I wanted you to save me, yeah. man. Like I thought you were gonna fix me. I'm a, I'm a." I'm a, uh, you're so cool. Like, I, I love your live stream. Like, Pokimane, please yeah. save me. Like, <laughs> again, yeah, dude. like, may have hit different in 2003. Just, I just thought it was just poop now. Like, reading, <laughs> reading, the, reading, reading that final, <laughs> that sort of like final exchange before Benno slash Dick, like, finally pulls the trigger. Uh, I, I didn't, and his, I didn't. His, de- his devolving into madness is like just like he was he was working for he was working for Eric and then like he was following the, the bat bot and then like uh but then his like problem is like it just got too fast. Yeah, he just couldn't keep up with like Eric's the technology they were employing in, in analysis or whatever. And he's like, I'm a piece of shit. I Which can't. I guess probably is like, oh, commentary on like the speed of our society. Who is it leaving behind? What are they going to be? Oh, they're incels. Right. Uh, okay. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They watch, they watch Keith Woods videos. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> I need a nice prior state to come back. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I can exactly. comfy. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I still think the end and all the, all the parts with Dick Sheets are probably my favorite, but it did end on a note that I didn't really expect because, you know, Sheets is like in his, in the first passage where he's mentioned night, um, you see his like insanity and his downward spiral and it's intriguing. And then to get to the point that at the end where he's just kind of like sobbing and Eric kind of like figures him out because he's such like a night. He's so good at like reading people's faces and he's like, oh, can I have a cigarette? Which is like, not an smoke. autist characteristic true not at all that's sociopathic just, more it was kind exactly. of like uh just anticlimactic like i wanted that character of sheets to be uh like more over the top than he ended up being he kind of ends up being this like worthless character i think they're supposed to be having a eric a connection of some kind right, right? like it's supposed yeah, to definitely. be like the one the one human connection he has ironically or whatever. Is, like, right. And that's why, which again, it feels a little heavy handed and over the top to me. It's like, it's that moment of like, <laughs> it's like from a fucking romantic comedy. It's like they reach out and hold hands. And it's like my prostate's asymmetrical too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Or, or, or just like a serious romance. It's like from the notebook. I and think that's it, supposed to be funny. No, yeah, it, it was. Is. It, it was. Is, funny. Right? It is. It okay. is funny. It is. Funny. That actually made me laugh too. But yeah. it. But it's. But it's also like a little much. Uh, right, and that's okay. It's kind of the ways. next line. Yeah, you know, um, too, and that's okay. You're not a bad person. Exactly. Like, Thank yeah, you so exactly. much. And uh, he's like, if you also li- hurt, listen to your prostate, you could have made fucking billions, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is well, kind of a weird, also thing to say. That was fu- that was an interesting thing, like like so like what is the point of that right so at the end benno slash dick says to him like oh if you had just listened to your prostate and your body you could have made more money so like what what's the lilo trying to say there like if you embrace corporeality you'll be more successful in capitalism like what's the what's the what's the takeaway there i don't really get it that's that's a a good uh one of those lines where i just it, it comes across as like shiny and like interesting yeah on when you first read through root, root through the sentence but then when you think about it two seconds you're like this means absolutely nothing it doesn't make sense it feels like it's using it, yeah it feels like thematically just off it feels like something out of like a you know one of these like new age like 
philosophical HR departments. It's like, oh, well, we're in a digital age. So the real way to make money is to be human. Yeah. It's, it's like, what? Like, is that the point? Like, I don't know. That that line just struck me as, as hollow and weird. Yeah, it's just unclear to me. I, like, I see some of the things being brought together that in conflict and why. But this final confrontation, while it was, I also think I was with you, Paul, like in spite of myself, I was like, that was the most engaged I was. I was like, ooh, I'm actually, it's a page turner right now. <laughs> like what's going to yeah. happen? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, it, it leaves me pretty out of like, I don't know, the, the assessment of what's even going on. Yeah. According to DeLillo. Right. Like where does it fit thematically? I just, and I, I, I just didn't, I guess I'm in the minority here. I did not like the the ending or the final confrontation. I didn't think like Dick Sheets did not feel <laughs> did not well, feel like plausible yeah. to me as a character. He's not like motivated, not not like like himself his own motivation, but like the way he's written, it's not motivated or direct or clear to me. Like he vaguely lost his job and but like for there's no and i and i guess maybe this is the commentary like this is the way these people are like it's not a direct vendetta or anything it's it's a sort of more broad based like anger at society or the world or whatever and maybe that's what delillo was trying trying to capture but i it it it, it he was not a compelling character to me i i didn't i didn't get a sense of his like real motivations at all uh, or you know there's that line at the end which is like i wanted you to save me and i hated that part so if, if that was supposed to be some big reveal about his like motivations or something it didn't work for me i mean that I, was I, a that was a cringe moment for sure like uh, and like eric kind of tears up in that moment too and he feels bad for him and has that human connection but it's it didn't hit me either but i think i was just saying that like most of the book didn't hit with me and these few passages at least brought some like a different perspective to the overall story that was going on and maybe he's not like a really well-developed character but um i just thought it was like the best written passages um and it had like the most potential maybe it didn't feel like forced like so much of the rest of the book did uh and maybe i just i, I was getting glimpses of uh the New York trilogy by Paul Auster a bit, which is like, if you want to actually read someone who's like a byproduct of a city going insane slowly. Yeah. That, that happened. all of those stories kick fucking ass. Yeah. Maybe we should read that for the pod. <laughs> I love that. I've read it twice, but I'll read it again. I, my simple also just assessment too, is just sort of like, I was say, I said before, like Eric is either, wants to be or is like an avatar for capitalism like he just wants to be the force of of like human capitalism and so like i don't know it's like ben 11 is like you i wanted you to save me and he's like talking to the the concept of like mm. capitalism as a, as a way to organize an economy or something right just okay like, this completely like deranged like white collar guy who's confused now he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing yeah, so yeah. that's all i got for that really I, I guess, yeah. In terms of like, is it kind of like a Great Gatsby ending moment? Mm, a little bit. That's a, that's an is interesting that comparison. That's no, I don't think so. I think that's actually really interesting. I don't really know what to say. Do you about think it Eric's Jesus because but... he shot his hand and gave himself stigmata? <laughs> 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 I love just saying that someone's a Christ figure because, they, <laughs> because their hand hurts. It's, so, it's just always so easy to just do it so facilely. <laughs> Eric Christ, a Christ figure, like Aslan. <laughs> Aslan. <laughs> um, uh, one one of the other kind of maybe you know plot points that I wanted to talk about is w w why do you guys think he kills Torval? Because his bodyguard, who's there like throughout the whole book, and sort of constantly giving him the feed of like, oh, we have this threat. I, first of all, that worked way better for me than the final confrontation. It's it was like a it was like a horror movie vibe, right? Like in a lot of horror movies, yeah. the lead up is way better than the actual like reveal or whatever. And mm -hmm. yeah, totally. For, for me, the sort of like, like the conjuring that you just watched, like the conjuring, which I just watched for the <laughs> first time last night. Like the 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 back half of that movie was ass, basically. Um, yeah. And not it wasn't ass, but it was it it was it fell into that 
that that trough where it's the 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 the, the explicit stuff part is not scary. Similarly here, I thought it was kind of eerie and cool and interesting where it's like, there's this threat against your life. We don't get any specifics. And I almost like wish the, the, the like Ben 11 sections weren't there to like give us the insight into what was happening. Like it felt cooler and weirder to me when it was undefined and un like not explicated in that way. Um, and then I actually appreciated the fake out where you thought it was the guy who was going to kill him, but it turned out to be just like some performance artist who pies rich people. I did um, like that too. I, I actually, that, that, was that, was, a fun, that was a funny part. That was one of my favorite moments in the book when there, there's, there's this description. You're like, oh, this is it. He's going to be confronted by Ben 11 and assassinated or whatever. But it just turns out to be some like performance artist who loves to throw different types of pies in rich people's faces. Well, he, well doesn't he describe himself as a pie assassin? A pie assassin, yeah, really yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So because up until that point, like the the mention of assassins was giving me those equilibrium type early two thousands Charlie's Angels vibe, was just like don't say assassin, it's just right, me. right. <laughs> but then when I when it got to the pie assassin part, I was like, that is funny. I that and, that, that that may have been my favorite moment in the book for sure actually mine too probably yeah and now he was that, like i was gonna I go for it. the president but i i decided to make a bigger statement and go for you yes yeah exactly which you know obviously right you can read that in the sort of like basic like who really has power in american society it's finance capital and not mm-hmm. political you know etc cetera, etc cetera. right well and the big difference with that scene in particular and the characterization between Eric and uh, what's his name in freaking American Psycho, Tyler Durden. What is it? Patrick, <laughs> Patrick Bateman. Bateman. <laughs> is that, it's all the uh, same. It's all the same. <laughs> well, Bateman had more of like a, he had a problem with like being dirty and like he, he was like, he would, he would react in a disgusted way towards that, you know, and feel like uh, socially shamed by it. But Eric has more of like a badass bodybuilder hot boy vibe and like licks the uh, pie off of his face. Eric, Eric is just he up, just but... loves he loves getting hurt and being humiliated and, and like reminding himself that he's like there and that he eventually just shoots his own hand. I think yeah. like, uh, yeah, I think one of the things DeLillo was trying to do over the course of the story, because like you're right, Paul, and that's a really I think that's a really interesting comparison between Bateman and, and Packers. Like by the time he gets to the barbershop, the dude should be fucking filthy. He's covered in pie. His clothes are ripped from climbing over a fence after shooting a dude point blank. He probably has blood spatter on him. He he, he like probably looks like over him. shit. He's, he's, sex a he's got cum all over him. He's been tased. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I feel like I, I, I almost wish DeLillo had played that up more, you know? <laughs> Like to to the like where you know, because it is referenced like the barber makes a comment like your hair looks like shit dude you look crazy yeah and yeah I almost wish he had played that up a little bit more the sort of degeneration of the sort of like slapstick aspects of the whole thing you know because it yeah. is almost like slapstick like the dude's tased he's pied in the face <laughs> he fucking, know. like you know what I mean like I think that yeah. would have been so cool. To have that aspect of the story played up more, like Eric's appearance degenerating along with his mental state, like over the course of the story, <laughs> like I think that would have been great. And you don't get that as much as I as I maybe would have liked. I think that would have been really funny. Yeah, it's true because I I, I would forget all the time. I'd be like, just another handsome, clean cut gentleman. Mm-hmm. Like, no, this motherfucker yeah. is like right exactly. Sons a lot of clothing. Yeah, he's all stained and ripped up. Yeah, and and he the, and and the, you know he mentions like he when he shoots Torval, he drops the gun and he cl- climbs over the fence and rips his clothes and like it, he he must look like absolute garbage by the time he gets to the barber shop. But like the way it's written, you still picture him as this kind of like yeah buttoned up Patrick Bateman person. But yeah, but there is a you. distinction a there, and I wish Delillo had played that up a little bit more. Yeah, I didn't really think about that, but you're right. When he got to the barbershop and he mentioned his hair, I was like, oh, yeah, he should be, like, filthy right now. Right. Why haven't we heard more about that? Yeah, you're right. But, yeah, we didn't really talk about why why he, we think he killed Torval, right? Right. That was the answer. Um, I went off. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I, I just think he got he's jokerized a little bit. Um, 
I can't I can't think of like thematically why he would do it either. It's just like he's felt like he domed a little bit. But but that but thematically that would be something he would like. True, but he wanted the even bigger dom of an actual assassin. Mm. Sure, he's yeah, he's true, cl- he's true, got a true. assassins. He's got a death wish. Like I think that's pretty clear throughout. Like yeah. and as things go less and less his way, the more and more he's just like ah maybe he just he just literally wants to play like Russian roulette at at the, at the very end there. So he's he's jokerized. Yeah, he's joker jokerified. Yeah, he's. His haircut was getting it dyed green. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> that would be fucking in epic. that moment. <laughs> Cause he's got one side of it's like cut. The other's long. He's well, I wasn't green. actually going to Sk- say Skrillex Joker. I oh was my say that God. Skrillex Joker. End, <laughs> it does kind of seem like it could have been a story about the, uh, the birth of Heath Ledger's Joker <laughs> missed opportunity for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, when when Torval was killed, I I read that and I was like, did I miss something? Was he like uh, a double agent for some other assassin mentioned in the early right. part of the book? I just I felt like I missed something when that happened. But me I'm too. Not sure it's, if I it's, did. It, it's very abrupt. I mean, I thought when it's when it's written that he shoots Torval, I thought he shot one of the random people on the basketball court. Cause it just yeah, says, I, read, it just I had to go back and read it again. Cause it I just, shot him. It just says I shot the man or he shot yeah. the man or something. It's, and it's not clear who it is that he killed, but then it becomes clear that it was, it was Torval. Um, and, and yeah, I think you're right, Matt. I think he's just looking for that. You know, he's, he's fucking joker fied at that point for sure. And he's like, I'm losing all my money. I'm going to lose my wife's money. And, uh, I do not want this safety valve bodyguard anymore. Um, yeah, basically. He's just trying to force so yeah. the issue. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know who Nancy Babbage is. I looked it up. I thought it might be a reference to a real person, but I don't think it is. I think it's just a made yeah, up I'm, name. There's like a musician, but it's like she's super recent. So I think that person is probably named after the person in this book. Yeah, I think it's a band. It's yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. All right. Any final th- right. final thoughts before we go into uh, the closing the closing segments segmentos? Closing let arguments. me let me look up my uh, my one uh, Scrabble word that I don't okay think I've got it. Should we viable. do that first? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So new segment. Thanks to Paul. Uh, the last episode you started this Paul. Last episode. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, brand spanking new dude. Brand spanking new segment. Uh, where we pick the 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 best Scrabble word or a word we didn't know. I mean, am I summarizing accurately? I mean, yeah. Last last time I did more of like a word I didn't know and thought was cool, but this time I thought more about the actual game of Scrabble and nice. like what would be a good word for that game. So. Hell yeah! Okay, sweet. You can do it either way, probably, or both, or both. Ideally, both. All right, you go first, Paul. Okay. So your this is your segment. My word is uh, quacha, Ooh. which is the currency in Zambia. How do you spell uh, that? How do you spell that? K W A C H A. That yeah, that would be a great Scrabble word. Yeah, it's I just not thought bad. It, it K. Good, uh, what is? I think K is five. No. W is four. C is three. K K H might is, K might be. How much is K in Scrabble? I feel like it's. I think it might be five. I'm looking it up right now. Okay. Uh, yeah, five. And five. H is four. And H is four too. Yeah. So that that would so, be a big. That would be a heavy hitter word. Big word. You said it's from. It's a. It's Zambia. Is the. It's yeah, the, the currency, currency in Zambia. That's. A it good was one. mentioned like first twenty pages, and I underlined. I was like, oh, cool. That's a good That's one. One. Um. Okay, Matt. Do you want? Do you have one, or do you want me to go? Well, I, I, Matt I'm, forgot. I'm Matt admitting. Forgot. No, no. I still have what I think is a cool one, but it's. I admit that it. it I think it's disallowed because it's a different language. Yeah, no, 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 no. Well, it depends. If we're going by, like I said, class. Yeah, Kasha might be disallowed on that. On that rule. Oh. But no, it, no, that no. money is at least like impersonal in some way, or yeah. like, you know, not a colloquial or whatever. Uh, so, I'll allow like, it. I, this I is not a Scrabble rules podcast. Su- <laughs> Susto. 
Ooh, S U S T O, susto, meaning soul loss. It's a Caribbean word. Ooh, where, where did that According come According to the I book. Remember, I don't remember that. In the book. 152. Okay. 152. Yeah, so that's that's what I'm going to go with. I Next time nice. I will, I forgot. So next time I'll be more on the lookout for like. Oh, yeah, there it is. Probably the more like, you know, standard, standard, uh, good competitive play allowable word. I mean, my rating for that for Susto is pretty low i mean it's got that's not a lot of points. Points. value not a lot of points i'm pretty but... sure all of those are one point letters yeah so shut up okay <laughs> i think about it later dude. i'm gonna knock okay. it out of the park next time <laughs> all right mine is uh a d de- i think it's decent for scrabble mine is fug f-u-g oh nice uh, fug. so it, I, it's not bad right what oh yeah Sebum? Sebum, Sebum would be pretty good too m and b I think are both three. So fug, I like because F is three, G is two, U is one. It's short. You can tack it on to a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't know it, the word at all. And it, it means a warm, stuffy, or smoky atmosphere in a room. And uh, Delillo here uses it in reference to the smell of urine somewhere. Uh, and smoky he, he says the, the fug of yeah. urine. <laughs> and i was like yeah i like it so i didn't know the word and i think it'd be good for scrabble nice that's a good one I bot is it. probably okay too yeah for doing currents yeah. I, I want i feel like all currency must be acceptable yes yes i think they probably are but yeah bot would definitely be acceptable and bot would be good three four yeah. one one yeah sick when Love i type in fug on on uh and google it's a, the people. It says people also ask, "What does fug mean in British?" <laughs> in British, I just feel like that's not the way to say that, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Harry Potter. Welcome to the fan favorite segment about Harry Potter, which we referenced earlier in the episode. We literally just read another book. Mm-hmm. So it was Cosmopolis by Don DeLillo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, who do we do first? Goodness gracious. Uh, I don't want to do too many of the characters. Yeah, I feel like we don't get enough of most of them. Like... Eric. I think probably Eric, the Eric, wife. The wife and Benno, Dick. Okay. Yeah, okay, I think that's, that's good. good. Let's start with the wife. Elise Schifrin. Good, like, uh, good Slytherin. Good Slytherin. Okay. Hmm. How? Why? Just kind of indulgent and probably ultimately out for herself. But uh, you know, it's Slytherin's. She's hereditary aristocracy. She's just kind of okay. You know, she's doing doing her her poetry and kind of indulging in self expression and but she'll be fine ultimately. And she's part of a noble bloodline and lineage. And the bloodline thing is very crucial. She's yeah. just kind of, she's just kind of chilling and, you know, she does, she gets emotional about the marriage and stuff, but ultimately she doesn't seem to really care. She's, she's all, yeah. She's ultimately above it all. Yeah. Yeah. Above it all uh, I'm match. actually, I'm actually sold. Wait, you yeah, said me too. good Slytherin. Yeah. Like nice. Yeah. Slytherin. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm sold. Yeah. I agree. I think she yes. would hang out with some Gryffindors and some Hufflepuffs. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But still feel They're... above them, but she'd hang out with them. So. You can be friends, yeah. yeah. I'm sold. Uh, Me sick. too. All right. Uh, uh, Dick Sheets. Jim Sheets. Dick Sheets, dude. He's Hufflepuff. like, he's like, uh, yeah. I Squib? Like he's a dirt... <laughs> Squib. Squib. He was like, was a Hufflepuff, and he got like demoted to Squib. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> he is, he's parasocial, like, yeah, in a weird way. And he wishes uh, he was magical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's like, I can't keep up. Like, once it started to get a little too magical in the office, <laughs> yeah. he was like, I can't do it. Um, Thematically, I like that a lot. I think the little should have used that in this in this book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean they were already out so some of the books so yeah come on yeah i, I think squid what if the final line was in the squib killed the slytherin 
Oh, <laughs> uh, even the alliteration. It's so beautiful and literary. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think he's a squib. He's a squib. And yeah, then, okay. I'm sold. I like that. Eric is evil Ravenclaw. Eric is Ooh, yeah. He's Slytherin. I think he's pure Slytherin. Why Slytherin? I mean, he, how more out for yourself can you be? But he's not like weird and conniving about it. He's just like this dumb, like robot person. Like yeah. he loves the knowledge and he wants to fuck the numbers and shit. Yeah, he wants. He wants to. He wishes his wife. He was a Platonist. He wishes his wife was like the a number. number a billion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he could really... put his dick in all of the zeros. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, do I you think... think that like uh, like Elon Musk would be evil Ravenclaw then? No, Elon Musk would be just evil about... Slytherin because he comes He's from a rich sli- family. He he like Eric is at least comes from a poor background and worked his way up because he's a genius or whatever. Elon right, Musk yeah, is but... literally a hereditary, literally like blood diamonds in South Africa. Yeah, he's he's bad Slytherin. I don't know. Eric's I'm very so, bad I'm... Ravenclaw, but he's Ravenclaw. I'm, with, I'm, I'm going I'm, with Slytherin. I'm with Matt. I'm with Matt on this one. I just, I still, I, I feel like you guys still forget that, like Luna Lovegood was in Ravenclaw and his and her dad. Like, what, is that, know, I, what, is the, what does that have to do with Eric? Well, Eric has no like, <laughs> like, uh, I don't know, airy uh, spiritualness to him. Okay, but just usually because, give just good because, people the Ravenclaw. Just because Luna Lovegood is airy and spiritual, that's not a that's not a fundamental quality of the Ravenclaw house. It is. No, it's it really not. is. Like what? Artsy, like the the uh, the creative, freaking... but that has a lot of meanings. I think exactly. Eric how, is very artsy, how and creative Ravenclaws... with numbers and predicting. <laughs> fucking the stock how market. Ravenclaws are portrayed in the Harry Potter movies, though, is what I'm you know gathering evidence from fucking as well. Absolute textualists. Yeah, fucking... dude. What are you fucking? That Italian guy that was on the Supreme Court. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's yeah. definitely me. Paulton and Scalia. <laughs> I don't know. There's a. I just don't see him as a Ravenclaw at all. I just can't get past like how, how uh, I portray like, a Ravenclaw Paulton in my and own Scalia. brain. He wants so to I'm literally turn strong, into. Uh, a mind. He wants to turn into numbers and fuck them. That seems like a Slytherin weird individualist perspective no. to me. No, he wants to merge. Right. He wants to merge into the numbered universe. He doesn't. He doesn't even want an individuality anymore. I'm not budging. Fine. He does want to live forever, like Voldemort. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna stick with it. I'm, I'm yeah. gonna go bad Ravenclaw. Bad Ravenclaw. Yeah, I'm with it. I'm going like Mount Rushmore level Slytherin. Wow, that's epic. Okay. okay. I think there's that's a there's an argument for that though for sure. So. <sighs> All right. Uh, healthy disagreement. Healthy disagreement. Yeah, it makes us all better and smarter. Yeah. Um, score time, Dibs on first. All right. Uh, I'm going to give this book... Pro- <laughs> Got him. I'm going to give this book like a, a... Like a probably like a... Fuck, what? 1.8. Oh, sick. I love low scores. That's sick. That's lower than I thought it would be. That's awesome. Yeah, I was thinking about two, but I, I might have to go. I'm going 1.8. You can round up, folks, if you're mad at me. Yeah. So uh, I have to go next because Paul is Paul goes last because it's his book. Yeah, I'm right there yes. with you, Matt. I, uh, I I I really do not like this. Uh, I, I'm 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 at like a 1.92 because I, I think I think Delillo can can write obviously, and there's some really good like just turns of phrase and passages and, and a few, you know, insightful, in, insightful ideas and, and stuff. But like, overall, it was just a, it was a big, it, it was just a big wet fart for me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll change yeah. mine to a two. I, I feel like it's too negative to say 1.8. It, it's a two. 2.00. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm right. I'm right around the same with you guys. Uh, probably a two point one for me. Yeah. Not. Nah, yeah. That's yeah. Whatever. I uh, I didn't absolutely hate it. I think we said earlier that like between one or zero and and two or zero and one. 
zero and like one is life like, life alteringly bad yeah zero and one is like i my life is worse for having read this i definitely don't feel like yeah. that about this book so maybe no. i should bump it up over a two two but one one to two is bad two to yeah. three is like you know not great to okay right not great to good and then three yeah. to three to four is I mean, like the good to very good overall like the the biggest feeling i have i think is that i'm gonna forget about this book in like a day yeah it's like so incredibly forgettable that that really affects the score for me yeah but it's i didn't like two, two point five on a good day yeah being honest yeah. probably like a yeah two 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 point one yeah i mean it was a it was a wet fart though you're right it was just like <laughs> poorly executed it but I mean, I do give it some points for being at least ambitious. Like Delillo was trying to do something different, seemingly than how he has written in the past. So, oh, I'll be reading more of him. I like me him too. I yeah, I'm going 100%. to too. And I think that yeah. there's probably even a few people that I talked to about this book before we recorded this, like online and whatever. Like they're like that. I saw bad place to start with Delillo. Like yeah, definitely I not. Saw you know. I saw a text thread that you were in on Twitter and you were like, I just read Cosmopolis and I actually really hated it. LOL. You wrote that. And the guy wrote back. And yeah. It was like, yeah, not a great place to start. LOL. Like he was yeah. kind of mad at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't fucking know, dude. Yeah. If you, if you, I mean, like who is that on? Right. Like if you write a corpus of books, don't you, you can't dictate to me the order that I read them in. Right. Like either it's yeah. good or bad at some level. Right. Well, one, one thing, not to go off on another tangent because we're closing up, but one thing in art school that they always said is that like you're only as good as the worst piece in your portfolio. Yeah. And I actually want to talk about that and I forgot until just now, but I don't totally know if I agree with that, but it's like at least something I think about is like if you have one book that's in the twos or the ones, can that how can that not affect your overall portrayal as a artist or writer or musician or anything. I, I I agree with that to some degree, but I also don't, we don't have to get into it, but, but it, That's it's, not like, worms. it's not like a yeah, baseball game, yeah. right? Like where you show yeah. up and have a bad day. It's not quite, yeah. like, it's not quite like that. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, like if, yeah, if the Yankees lose 12 to zero and they have like the best record or yeah, something, yeah. sports anyway, <laughs> numbers, money ball. All right. Uh, money ball. Shall we? wrap it up yeah. yeah all right everyone come back next week where we're talking about uh patty chayefsky's novel not screenplay altered states yeah mm, sci-fi vibes guest. will be joined by a very special guest get Ooh, excited I'm preemptively not gonna tell you. for a week <laughs> yeah. i just said it <laughs> i have anxiety for a week i want yeah, exactly yeah uh yeah. Smith. all right we gotta and go thanks. matt's matt's gotta go play mini golf so we're out of here that's yes. right. I had a hard out for an important appointment. <laughs> I'll see you later. I'm going to go get a haircut across uh, town. I'm going to go take a shower because I haven't showered yet today. <laughs> take all those nice all right. little details and do what you want with them. That's right. Bye. I love y'all. Bye. Yeah.